<laughs> yeah, your adrenaline's always up. I won't, I won't kid you, it is an adrenaline rush. I mean, like, even the times when I got shot at, that was an adrenaline rush as well. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> wait, wait, uh, we roll that back a minute. <laughs> So I met a lot of people through the rave scene in those days. I mean, that's where I met Mr. Courtney yeah. and Carl at least Freddie Foreman. I met Frankie Fraser. I met, you know, everybody that was in that circle. Yeah. So next thing you know, I got sent to every trouble, every troublesome club they had and go sort that one out. <laughs> I'd upset a family in London. It was I was it was all down to a bit of work I did was doing. It was not wasn't a warning. It, they, were, they, were, they were coming to kill me. So for the next three months, you know, I carried a piece everywhere I went. Really? I slept with my bedroom door locked and something loaded on the side. This guy had tried to steal my livelihood. So he's got in the car and I banged the central locking button down. Then I pulled out a nine mil from under my seat and went and I chambered it in front of me. And then I Marcus, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you for having me. Yeah, very much looking forward to this one. It's a mutual contact of us, put us together. Yeah. Good old Dave. Oh, Dave, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, um, let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you end up getting associated with the criminal underworld? Yeah, it sort of, well, started in, I live in Ramsgate, born and bred in Ramsgate, which yeah, for anyone who doesn't know where Ramsgate is, it's near Margate. Um, it's like literally a couple of miles away from Margate. So, yeah, I grew up down there um, on a small holding, like a little farm. Uh, I grew up on, which was a bit of a weird upbringing. Um, so I got into, actually I'm a qualified tree surgeon. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the only <laughs> things I've got a qualification in. Um, and um, yeah, I've got certificates in arboriculture, horticulture. But what happened was I started earning more money working at the nightclubs, um, basically. Mm. Uh, it all started off actually when I was only 17. Yeah. Um, I was, so, I, li so life for you growing up, what was, it, what was your school life like? School life, well, yeah, it was a bit of a nightmare, actually. Um, that's really what sort of, I think, what sort of moulded me a lot and sent me in the direction I went. I was bullied at every school I went to. So I got bullied in infant school. I beat up the bully in the end. Yeah. Uh, I got bullied in junior school. Same thing happened there. And then in senior school, I got bullied quite badly. And I, I think I was about about 13 by the time I decided to go to the boxing club locally and yeah. and, and I was a shit boxer I really was <laughs> I mean I was I was in there for a couple of years just getting my head pounded yeah. um, but in the end I, I just kept going kept going and I got better and I got better and I loved the bag work yeah. and uh, and in the end uh, yeah I, I, no one picked on me at school yeah. I, I bashed up the boys that were two years older than me yeah. you know um, and, and I never looked for a fight I never caused a fight and I think that was the I hate bullies and even to this day it's sort of like a pet hate of mine mm. You know, and so it was sort of quite natural for me that I, I ended up actually when I was we used to like be underage as everyone does underage drinkers, right? Mm. So there's a little pub we used to sneak in in Broadstairs when we were 15, 16. Mm. So I was a regular in there for like a couple of years, and a big fight kicked off, and I ended up breaking the fight up, threw the people out, walked back in, and the owner went, he said, "You're here every week." He said, "How about if you do that, and I'll give you a free beer?" <laughs> I thought, lovely. I didn't even think about it as being a doorman, yeah. but basically that probably was my first door yeah. job. Yeah. And then, and then when I got to be, what was it? I was thinking I was 18 or 19. I actually got, I was training in a gym by then um, and a lot of the doormen were using it and I started knocking about with them on a the weekend. I'd, I'd go into where they were working and they, a couple of times things kicked off, I got involved. So the next thing you know, they've offered me a job. Mm. So I was a very young, you know, apprentice doorman, mm. if you like. And I, I had some good fortunes and bad, really. I worked with two guys, uh, well, three guys, one of them who's still, to this day, I was still a really close friend of mine, great guy. What's his um, name? Big Lloyd. Yeah. He's he's like a he looks like the missing link. I mean, he's got a jaw <laughs> like it would make Arnold Schwarzenegger look like a fairy. Yeah. You know, uh, he's six foot four. He's currently about one hundred and forty five kilos. Mm. He's a he's a yeah, unit. Lump. Yeah. But he was like your anchor man in those days. He nothing nothing shook him. You know. But then there were two other guys we worked with who were just really big, horrible doormen. Mm. And they were, the, uh, they were the epitome of the bad doormen. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't just knock someone out, they'd stamp all over mm. you, beat you up. Mm. They, you know, they, they did everything wrong. Yeah. But they showed me how not to do it. Yeah. And you know, this other guy, Lloyd, was a good influence. And uh, it, we sort of moved on and I started to get a, you start when you're a young doorman, you've got to first of all build a reputation for yourself, which is the hardest bit, because you don't even know if you're going to be any good at the job yourself. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's, there's no, there was no, there was no door courses in them days. No, it, wasn't it, was, a, it was full on bouncers, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's you, a bomber jacket, yeah. there's a bouncer, off you go. I mean, basically, you just found a, you know, if you knew a local hard nut, you'd say, yeah, yeah. fancy a job. Yeah. You know, and you didn't care about whether it was a criminal record or not. It's yeah. like, it was whether he could have a row or not. But it's changed so much over those last sort of 40 years, which is a long time. You know, um, I mean, but that's where it started for me in, in, in Margate. 
And um, what rough what rough year, Marcus? Are we talking here? We're talking oh, mid eighties, oh, late eighties. Yeah, 80s. you're definitely in the eighties. Yeah, because yeah. I would have been like I said, I was born in sixty two. Yeah. So I'm sixty now. Yeah. Right. I'm retired. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> but in those days, yeah, I'd have been about I'd have been like I said, eighteen, eighteen, nineteen yeah. years old when I got my first proper door job. Um, and 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 you were you were thrown in very much at the deep end. There was only there were no radios. There was no uniforms. You know, you turned up at the time you're supposed to be there, and you just had to. You had no training, so you had to learn as a young dog. And had to try and learn off the other ones. Mm. Um, but you had to learn to you know to talk to people, to suss situations out. I remember when I first started, I was always getting smacked, you know, because I'd go over and tell someone off, and I'd stand there like this, you know, and then wallop, you know. And, but after you get it a few times, you get a bit wise to it, and you, yeah. next thing you know, you walk over there and you sort of like you know yeah. you're on guard, and you and you can tell by people's demeanor you can tell by their attitude you can tell by their body yeah. their, their breathing everything yeah. you start to learn very quickly what's going to happen yeah. yeah and so you preempt it you know um and you start reading people a lot better um and so yeah I mean, and also on the seafront down there in the summer i mean we used to it wasn't like a little club where you throw one or two guys out mm. having a fight these were coach parties fighting coach parties <laughs> and there's still only two of us to deal with it yeah and that's, you know, that's, there is no training for that. <laughs> and that's down in Margate in the summer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I used to work at a place called the, it's not there now, so I'm telling you, Bar Majestic, which was a pub downstairs, held about 350 people. And then a nightclub upstairs called the Acer Clubs. Um, and the Acer Clubs had a reputation. It was open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but it had a reputation. Both places did for, for violence, basically. Yeah. And particularly in the summer. Um they, I don't know why, but they didn't actually start us till nine o'clock in the evening. Pub was open then from seven. Yeah. So all the coach parties would get in. Pile in. And when yeah. we arrived at work, you know, just the two of us, it'd be like full on, they'd be dancing on the pool tables, throwing <laughs> drinks over each other. And, we used, to, and we, used to, we used to walk in the door, we used to ignore them, right? We used to walk straight to the bar. You're allowed to drink in them days. Yeah. And we'd go like large scotch. Yeah. And we'd look at each other and go, come on in, <laughs> let's go to work. You know, and then you have to get off the pool table, stop doing that, yeah. and then you start chucking people out. Yeah. And you know, and that's where, it, like I said, you you had to learn to be quite diplomatic because if you're throwing, you know, if you're throwing two guys out who are part of a 50 strong coach party, yeah. his 48 mates aren't too yeah. happy about it. But if you did it in the right way, you could normally you could normally get away with it. Yeah. Were you good at Were you good at talking your way out of things? Uh, not to start with. No. Okay. It, it, it comes just the more you do it, you know, like anything, you know, uh, the more you do it, the better you get. Yeah. So, yeah. But it, like I said, you you definitely you have to get quick. You have to get good quick yeah because you know i think by the time yeah by the time i was sort of i mean i spent my 18th birthday i got jumped on by seven guys on my oh no on my 21st birthday yeah. i was getting the shit kicked out of me around a nightclub because <laughs> this this club downstairs <laughs> there was no radio so downstairs shuts at 11. isn't that mad to think though I know. just like no radios that same place like, now yeah. would have six or eight door yeah. staff right and they'd all have to be trained and they all have to have radios yeah. and body cams and all yeah. that right yeah but we managed to control it with only two of us. Yeah. And at one point, you see, the downstairs would still be open till half 11, yeah. and the upstairs would open at half 10, so you were separated, one up, one down. Yeah. And the uh, and the of Clubs was this horrible staircase. I think it had something like 52 stairs going up into it, right? And it was so narrow, that was a lucky thing, that saved our lives. It was so narrow that you could barely get two people next to each other. So one, maybe two people at a time could come up it. Yeah. And I remember on many occasions, I've got like 50 guys in a coach party threatening me, but there's only two of them at the front. Yeah. And I'm actually stood there and I'm going, all right, guys, look, I know you want to kill me, but who's going to be first? <laughs> because I can take out one or two and they literally just roll over the rest, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, some class. Awesome. So, so for you then, obviously 18, 19, 20, 21, were you thinking about, I want to build a firm here, I want to build a team around me? No, at the time, no. it was just the fact that what it was, I, I, like I said, at that time, I had a, a full-time job working on council, cutting trees down. I was earning £84 a week take-home yeah. pay, <laughs> right, good, in good old days, and I was earning £90 a week doing three evenings. Yeah, okay. So the two together was allowing me to live reasonably, but my, my, it was a temporary thing at first. I just thought I'd do it for a while, earn a bit of money. Yeah. I, I never saw it going the way it ended up going, mm. I always wanted to be a, a gym owner. Um, I always wanted to get into my training, which is something I did do. I did actually open my own gym. I did that for a few years, but um, the real money didn't start rolling in. It's even if you're a very good doorman, you can only earn so much an hour, yeah. you know, so much a night, yeah. yeah, and you can only earn while you're working. Mm. But it, it was very plain to me when I started doing, when I thought about the agency thing, I was in, and, and by the way, when you start these things, it's normally out of inspiration or desperation. Yeah. And with me, it was a little bit of both. I was, I'd, I'd gone through a, a messy divorce with my first wife. Um, she took the house, put a court order on the gym. I had nothing, lived in a bedsit. 
uh, lived in and I, and I and I decided to start an agency yeah. and I thought my name's Marcus I'll call it Mark One yeah. right <laughs> it carried on for another 30 odd years yeah, right. but it, I started it when I remember I started it, I had six doormen who were out of work right six good doormen I had their telephone numbers um, and that was in the days of the old mobile phones that were like a brick, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I'm living in a bedsit. I've got my little brick phone, and I've, and, I've, and I've made a brochure up with Mark One Security, and I made some little gold plastic cards, which were a bit posh. Mm. They looked like a credit cards, and I used to hand them out to everybody. Anyway, and I, I went around for six months trying to get a contract, and I, I tried everywhere. I went here, I went there, and I didn't get anything, yeah. right? And then, um, and then all of a sudden, I got a phone call out of the blue from a club in Folkestone. Um, it was a, a club called La Parisienne. And it was a it won Disco the Year Award. Okay. It was like it cost two and a half mil at the time yeah. to put together. So um, they said, "Look, all our door teams walked off the door. Have you got sixteen doormen?" I said, "Of course I have. <laughs> I, I had them. six. <laughs> yeah. I just needed another ten for the weekend." <laughs> but in those days, it wasn't so hard because you know doorman knew doorman, and you could you ring up the local rugby club yeah. and get some big fellas in because you no one needed a license. Yeah. But anyway, I did it. I, I you know I managed to put it together, and I put a good team together, done a good job. That was my first proper contract that got me going. I never touched any of the any of the, any of the profits for two years. I just saved everything, put it away, stayed in my little bed sit. Yeah. I, I saved up enough for a deposit for a house. Yeah. Um, I just and I kept just trying to get more work, more work, and then a guy who I'd been working with actually I've got to say uh, called Frank Thorley, Thorley Taverns, uh, bless him. Uh, I've got to go to his funeral on Saturday. Okay. So he was like a giant of a man yeah. in this industry, and he took me on as a head doorman, and he I worked with him for years. He didn't want to lose me as his head doorman, so he was happy to take doorman from me for his other venues. Yeah. So he helped to expand my business as well. Um, so I think within the first few years, I got from like six up to like 50 staff. Brilliant. So we were doing, you know, we were doing cruising along quite nicely then. So how were, you, how were you earning then at the time? You were earning for yourself being on the door as a doorman yeah, and was, then you'll be taking a cut off yeah. the, uh, every I hour. Make, I used to try and make three pounds an hour on a doorman. Yeah. And what are you is, talking in? Mid 90s now, are we? Yeah, we're talking, uh, no, well, yeah, I suppose early, well, even when, it, when, I, was, when I got the prison, yeah, I was 28, so that's like 30 odd years ago. Yeah, so okay. that's the early, early sort of late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, okay. Um, so I was, I mean, I think I was charging then, I think, I think my margin was only two pounds an hour to start yeah. with. I would charge 10 pounds for a doorman yeah. pay him eight and keep two okay all right yeah um they were all on self-employed contracts um because the nature of the job you couldn't you couldn't compete in the in the thing otherwise yeah. but and then as time went on i mean the latter years then it sort of went up to obviously the, the, the prices went up but not a lot not enough really yeah and that's why everyone you, you get everyone out there moaning about quality of doorman nowadays if you really put the wages and you try and you know, you try and say what you're getting now yeah. to what we got then. Yeah. Like I said before, I used to work three evenings to make the same as my week's yeah. pay. Now, it's way under. Yeah. You know, if Dorman does three evenings, it's probably not even a third of what his yeah. week's wages are. Yeah. And if you're going to pay less, you're going to get less. Yeah. I'm not knocking the doorman who are out there, by the way. But yeah, no, but, but I hear you though because ones, this country but, is suffering yeah. with doorman. Well, the trouble is, everyone wants. The thing is, I looked at it the other day. I think a door course now, the new door course will, now, quid, will, will now take you a week, yeah. and it will cost you like six hundred and something yeah. quid. Yeah. And then after you've done the door course, you've then got to pay another two hundred for your license. Yeah. So you're looking at eight hundred pound plus a week out of your time. Yeah. Now and then you're going to get a reward of what, like ten pound an hour, yeah, or eleven or twelve, or ten or twelve, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but when we was, I mean, you know, I've always earned, I've always earned good money. Mm. Um, well, so maybe I was just very fortunate, or maybe I was just very good. Yeah, I think you're very good and fortunate, right time, the right place. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what are the movements there of growing that business? Then you were running. Were you running? Did you ever stop your daytime job? Oh yeah, yeah. It didn't. I did. I think I, it only took me a couple of years to figure out. Yeah. Um, because particularly because I wanted to train and I wanted to be able to train in the daytime so I wanted to train six days a week yeah. and the only way I could do that was if I was working nights yeah. so I, and, and working in the clubs you're only really working then sort of maybe five or six hours mm. so yeah it enabled me to do both I actually I started work six seven nights I was doing in fact for one time I think I don't think I had a day off I was like seven <laughs> nights a week when I started working with Thorley Taverns for about two or three years um, but I had all my days off so it was mm. lovely you know mm. I just go to the gym in the, in the morning have my afternoons free work every evening mm. It was great. And uh, w w when growing that business, was there like, did you deal with like the, Lum the Luminars of this world who had like 100 yeah. clubs at the time? And did you get big contracts? Well, yeah, I remember, I mean, I, I remember actually, like I said, I met Steve Thomas and Steve Dennis who started Luminar. I met them in the very early days when they just bought their first couple of clubs, just freshly formed the business. They opened one in Margate called Kiki's. And I, I actually, that was before I had my agency and I pushed it onto a friend of mine. 
Um, I didn't really understand it. Then when I saw what he was doing, I thought, oh, I'm going to have a bit of this. A piece yeah. of this. <laughs> so, but, but Steve Thomas was the next doorman. Yeah, as far as I know, Steve Thomas was yeah. the doorman and I believe Steve Dennis was a DJ. It was basically a doorman and a DJ got together and, and formed this multi-million yeah, pound... huge, was, wasn't it? Oh, huge. Mm. I mean, it's one of the biggest um, leisure companies in yeah, Europe, I yeah, believe. Yeah, it was. You know, I mean, think at one point they had like 400 clubs across the country. Mm. I think I had about 12 of their clubs each week yeah. for about 10 years. Well, I ended up... The club I got in Folkestone, the Prisienne, the first yeah. real contract I got, that went through a few sales but it ended up being owned by Luminar. Yeah. And when Luminar came in, they, they put this new manager in who um, was a proper idiot and he was basically ripping them off. And he would actually put posters in front of the cameras and then he would try and he'd put an extra till out on the reception and he was he was filtering Offing the money to, off. Yeah, after, okay. like one till was for them yeah. and one till was for him. Yeah. And I spotted what was going on. Well, one of my staff actually drew my attention to it. And the thing that I've always said, when I run security in a club, I'm not trying to line my own pockets. Mm. Like a lot of people, everyone thinks doorman are, yeah, yeah, doorman is selling the drugs, doorman is doing this. I wasn't. I always took my job very seriously. I was there to make sure that the good people had a good time, bad people didn't get in, Mm. and uh, and also the people I was paying my wages didn't get ripped off. Because I mean, I mean, this one of these managers actually said to me, "Oh, you can put another couple of extra people on your Mm. on your invoice if you want. You can have a bit out Mm. of it as well." And I went, "No, I don't want that. I just want to make my profit. But I want to make my profit." on like a load of clubs yeah. and I want it for a lot of years. Yeah. I'm not going to try and nick a bit of money and then lose everything yeah. and get a bad reputation. Yeah. So this particular manager, I just I went to the area manager of Luminar mm. and I said, look, this guy's ripping you off. Mm. Don't believe me, put a camera in, you'll mm. see it. So they put some covert cameras in and caught him bang to rights. He got arrested and taken away. Yeah. And then I got, I obviously got favour with the area manager. He now trusted me. Mm. So next thing you know, I got sent to every trouble, every troublesome yeah. club they had and go sort that one out. <laughs> so I got, I got one in Eastbourne. I got one in Dartford. I had one in Ashford. I, yeah. We had one in Gill- uh, Gillingham. We had yeah. another one in uh, Sittingbourne. So I had about six Luminar clubs at one point and they were very good for me because yeah. they were big teams. That's right. You know? And they were big clubs. They were the super clubs back they then. Were. Was, if yeah, I remember yeah. rightly, it was like 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 caps. Oh, yeah, everywhere. they were yeah. proper. They were, they were yeah. all big units and they were all earning me. From each one, I could make like a, you know roughly a £500 profit from yeah. the door and you know just at £3 an hour. Yeah. You know, so... You know, if you worked it out, I went from uh, I went from like uh, six dormant originally, and I went up to sort of fifty and hovered there for a while, and uh, and then after I went to a motivational thing in with uh, Tony Robbins, yeah, I come out of there wanted to take over the world, <laughs> so so I come out of there and within a year I'd gone from fifty staff to one hundred and twenty. Wow! And it just blew my mind. Wow. I'm, like, I'm like, that's it. I'm on They're a roll. big numbers, mate. Yeah, yeah. 120 I mean, are big numbers on your well, books. It's, it's a lot yeah. when, it, when you've got to find those people and get them, you know, everyone's got to be trained, everyone's got to be badged, yep. everyone's got to be insured, yep. you know, and then you've got to pay everybody. Um, and I paid my guys weekly, always did, because yep. I know the guys, they, they're not, the doormen are not great with money normally, yep. They're, yep. they live from one week to the next. Yep. So, yeah, um, I used to pick up, and originally I used to pay cash. So I used mm. to have to go and pick up a suitcase full mm. of cash from the bank. And, divvy up. and then I used to have to make up yeah. these wage packets every Friday, <laughs> which was another reason why the police started kicking me doors in. <laughs> because they thought, right, they, they saw on Fridays there'd be an endless string of meatheads yeah. turn up at my house, ring the doorbell, get a little packet and go off. <laughs> And obviously someone's gone, he's at it, <laughs> he's at right? It. So anyway, I, I got raided one time on the Friday evening, right, by the police. And they kicked through the doors, they come in and, and I went, what, we got you. And there's all these wages like, lined up. And I went, got me what? And he went, opened them up, he went, oh, Ben Smith. Oh, <laughs> so, so, so. Right, so all of a sudden, I went, yeah, wages. <laughs> and I said, hey, that got me dropped off tonight. Yeah. You can't arrest me. Yeah. <laughs> Quality. Yeah. What was it like, what was your lifestyle like? You said you were training in a day like most people. It big was, lump dorm and working at night. When you finished work, then you'd go off partying yourself. Yeah, I got into that. I must admit, when I first started on the doors, I didn't even drink. You know, I was, I, but I, I, yeah, I got, um, I, I sort of, when I got, remember, when I married for a couple, I ended up living with a guy who drank. So I started drinking. And then the rave scene happened, and I avoided that for a while, but eventually I succumbed to that as well. <laughs> And I can remember the first time I ever took a pill. Um, yeah, I'm no, I'm no angel. I'm not, I'm not on here saying I'm an angel, but um, I've never been involved in the dealing of it. But yeah. I used to go to a lot of parties, and yeah. I used to love it. I'd finish work at two a.m. in Margate or whatever, and I'd you know, quite often drive to London. By the time I was thirty, I'd drive to London and then party. That's where I met Mr. Courtney, yeah. and you know, I met I met um, Carlton, Carlton uh, Leach at a, a rave in Deal. Actually, yeah. one of my friends put on. So I met a lot of people through the rave scene in those days. And, and of course, when they found out I got all these doors and everything, you know, a lot of them wanted to be interested in that. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's got to stay. I just do the doors and that's it. Yeah. I, I saw I saw loads of people who, who were, for five minutes, they had this five minutes of fame. 
I mean, let's face it, if you want to be a drug dealer, right, first of all, to be a successful one, everyone's got to know you are one. Yeah. But then if everyone knows you are one, you're nicked. You're going to get clobbered, so, yeah. And I saw yeah. people who were driving around in Ferraris and living in big yeah. houses, and all of a sudden, oh, he's got 12, yeah. he's got 15. Yeah. And I, I didn't want to do that, I, you know. And uh, so I, all I wanted to do was just build something that made me money while I slept. Yeah. yeah? That was my goal. Yeah to make money wherever I was in the world. Mm. So, I mean, I, cause after, after the, what was it? I was, when I was 40, I started investing the money I was making here. I started buying properties out in Thailand. Yeah. I was going to retire there. Yeah. Another story. Yeah. But anyway, so, so I had, I had 12 houses over there all paid for. You had 12 hours out in Thailand. Yeah. yeah. I had 12 houses out in Thailand that were earning me a thousand pound a week. Yeah. I had the doors here, which was earning me what, four and a half grand a week. Yeah. And, um, and I did pay all my tax on it, by the way. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I was, and I was sometimes I would do a month here and a month there, which was quite nice because I'd get a month away from all the clubs and you know the door yeah. scene, and then come back and then work really hard again for a month and then mm. go again. Um, but I had to put good managers in place, and yeah, it was it was it just grew and grew. And as something grows in business, <clears throat> as we all know, jealousy comes along. Oh yeah. Was what was the jealousy like towards you growing this business from other 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 doormen? Oh, uh, I could think of quite a few occasions actually. And like I said, doormen are very hard to control because you know most doormen they think they're they're a bit you know they've got a bit of confidence obviously yeah. or they wouldn't be a doorman. Yeah. So you've got all these alpha males working for you. Now you get some really good ones, but you also get some you get some of them who want to. I mean, I mean like I've sacked some really good doormen yeah. because I've caught them nicking drugs yeah. off of people. I've caught them selling drugs. Yeah. So I've had them. I've sacked them yeah. instantly, whether they were friends or not. You know, um, and that's caused me some problems in the, you know, over the years. Um, one of my other doormen decided, he, he saw my bill one day um, and he decided, so he put a quote in at the club um, to nick my contract. No. Now, I mean, that's really cheeky. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, yeah. if you want to, I mean, I'd, I'd, another doorman, I, I got this business card handed to me. And it, anyway, and, it, and it, I, won't, so I won't embarrass him and say the name of his security company because he's still running. But it had this name of the security company on it. And I thought, I recognise the number. It's one of my guys. So I went up to him, I went, you started a security company? He went, no. I said, what's your number on that for then? I said, go on, fuck off. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I had another one. The, the other one who wanted to nick it, who actually went in and put a quote in and everything. Um, I dealt with him in quite a naughty way, really. Um, I didn't hurt him. Yeah. I didn't hurt him, but I did intimidate him very badly. Uh, you see, the thing is, when you're trying to, like I said, we've got all these guys working for you, you've got to build this reputation up, which is probably bigger than you really are. Yeah. I mean, I'm, listen, if you, I'm not a bad guy, but if you push me, you know, <laughs> then I will, I will just, just about do anything. Yeah. This guy had tried to steal my livelihood, yeah. right, blatantly. So I went to the club on this particular night, uh, it was a Thursday night, and I said to the head doorman, I went, can you put him on the front door? He went, why? I said, don't, don't ask me why, just put him on the front door. It was like the club was on three levels. So he stood on the front door. So I parked my car on the other side of the road. Anyway, I said, I said, come here a minute. I said, I need to have a chat with you. He said, oh, is it about that shirt that got ripped last week? I went, yeah, something like that. So he's got in the car and he's got in and I banged the central locking button down. So it's gone, Choom. then I pulled out a nine mil from under my seat and went, kick, kick, and I chambered it in front of him. And then I rammed it in his knee so hard and asked him if he wanted to take my contract. He absolutely shit himself. I mean, he went white. He was climbing up the car. He was crying, and I didn't. Honestly, I listen. I didn't go there to shoot him. That's for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I was like, "Do you want it? Do you want it? Yeah. You want it? You want it? You want it? You want it? So anyway, after like five minutes of that, I, I un un unchambered it and I let him out of the car. And, I, and he went, what, "What do we do now?" I said, "You go back to work and do your job. Yeah. Keep your fucking mouth shut." Yeah. So anyway, he told everyone. Right now, I didn't actually do anything to him, but the threat of it happening. He's now told everybody, right? So now that's gone around like all the doormen. Yeah. Now no one wants to nick my contracts anymore. Yeah. Happy days. Happy days. Yeah. But you know. <laughs> so when 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 you've got men like that and they're going off and trying to nick contracts and stuff, what's that feeling like inside of paranoia of people doing it? Uh. I don't know. I, I was never really paranoid, but you sort of you just watch out for it. Yeah. And this is another reason. You see, I've always I, and I've seen it happen to loads of other people who had security companies. It's okay up to a certain size, right? I used to I used to sort of pride myself in the fact that I would go round every main venue, got a visit from me yeah. every week. Yeah. Right. Even if I was only in there for an hour, I would be in the door. Right. So I, I used to do five hundred miles a week just driving from just around the bars. Pop your head in, yep. so I'm here. Pop your yeah. head in, see the head doorman, see the manager, yeah. is there a problem, everything okay, staff Brilliant. behaving themselves. And if we had troubles in that club, so say we'd had a few kickoffs in that club, yeah. then I'd work the whole night with the doorman yeah. to see what they were like, to see if I could spot the problems or if I could change anything or maybe swap some staff about to make yeah. it better. 
you know, so you don't, I mean, it's like you wouldn't put all your good eggs in one basket, mm. really, would you? You know, if you've got like, you know, if you've got 100 staff and you've got 10 really, you know, yeah. mentally good ones, yeah. right? Then you're going to, they're going to be head doorman. You know, yeah. you're not going to put them all in one, one venue. Mm. Um, but everyone always wants the best, mm. you know. Mm. But you try and structure a team. And a team is also, when you get to doorman, you know, you've got like, you've got your big sort of anchor men at the back. But then you also want your front of house guy who can talk to people, who's polite, who's, you know, who's smart. You know, and everyone, you've got your soldiers who will just do as they're told. Yeah. You know, if you can get some. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What was that feeling like when you were working the doors yourself, knowing that it's about to kick off and you've got to deal deal with it, and you're not too 100 percent sure of the it's, team around you? It's. It, I mean, yeah, your adrenaline's always up. I mean, it isn't. It isn't. I won't. I won't kid you. It is an adrenaline rush. I mean, I mean, like even the times when I got shot at, that was an adrenaline rush as well. Um, hold on, hold on. We, we, uh, we <laughs> roll that back a minute. Where would you get shot? In, in a club? Uh, first time actually was um, at my house. Uh, two guys were sent to kill me. Um, it was not wasn't a warning. It, they were they were they were coming to kill me. Um, I'd upset a family in London. It was I was it was all down to a bit of work I did was doing. A fella who'd had too much sniff yeah. and too much of an attitude. I tried. To, he, he was. I saw him arguing with one of my doormen, so I went over to calm it down. And uh, he went, you know, I said, look, mate, you know, can I help you? What's going on? He went, he went, who do you, you mug? He went, <laughs> fuck off, basically. So I right, looked at him, right? and I went, oh, mate, I'm the head dog, I'm trying to help you. Yeah. So he punched me straight in the face. I mean, I'm actually trying to help the guy. Yeah. So he's whacked me straight in the shops. So I went, I thought, bang, I've hit him back. And he's gone flying out the door. And um, he's, he's jumped back up, he's charged up on a bit of, bit of powder, yeah. and he's just run at me, and he sort of like wrapped himself around me. So I stepped out of the club and I picked him, I peeled him off of me and I picked him up above my head and I just took him and I went smash and I broke his leg. Um, I didn't mean to, but you know, in throwing him, I broke his leg. So, but he went back and told a different story to his family. He said that three doormen beat him up and they're bullies and blah, 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 which everyone would believe. Yeah. Um, not the fact that he was a knobhead. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, anyway, it, a while went by. This was in the summer. It wasn't until November the 1st that they sent two people to shoot me. And... Um, and I only just managed to sort of clock what was going on. I'd actually booked a night off. I was just coming out of my house. I was actually going to nip up the shops and get a bottle of wine and some cigarettes when I used to smoke. And uh, and then I saw these two guys walking opposite my row, opposite my house. And I just, as soon as I walked out, they just sort of slowed down and looked at me. And I thought, it's a bit of a weird vibe going on. But, I, you know, you, you, like I said, you've got this weird dormant thing. You're, <laughs> you're, you're sort of, you think, I think it's something not right because it's the main road I live on. And you don't stop. If you're walking, you're walking. Yeah. You know, you're going somewhere. So anyway, that, then I, I kept looking, I kept one eye on him, I got in my car, and then I saw this guy's arm drop down and I could see the silhouette of a gun. So I thought, shit. So I reversed the car off, he's come running across the road, started firing at me, and I stuck it in gear and shot off and sort of ducked, and he blew the back tyres out of the car and put a few holes in it. Um, and I know it was a nine mil because the casings were all over the floor when I got back. Yeah, <laughs> and I, went, I ended up going to the off license to get me a bottle of wine and my 20 fags <laughs> and told him, told him to phone the police. <laughs> But the police took ages, and then the then the police started then looking at me and going, "Oh, what are you involved in? You know, you you know you've well, this can't be about door work." And I said, "It is. Yeah. It's honestly about door work." And they they seem more intent on interested in me yeah. than finding the guys that had actually shot at yeah. me. So I said, "Look, just leave it." I said, "I sorted it out myself," and uh, and that was virtually around the same time that I met Dave Courtney. Yeah. And uh, and what age what age were you when you met about, Dave? Roughly, you're about thirty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah about thirty, and. Uh, so I met Dave and I said, oh, Dave, I've upset this family. And I, and I won't go won't say their name. But anyway, Dave had Dave knew the family. Yeah. So he had a chat with them. And uh, and I was assured that, you know, he sort of basically said, oh, he's a mate of mine, he works for me or whatever. I didn't work for him, but we were mates. Yeah. Um, but whatever, I didn't care what he said to him. Yeah. Just, yeah, as, long just, as, just yeah. as long as it stopped. Yeah. You know, because it was, um, it was a bit of a nightmare not knowing if they were going to come back and have another go. Yeah. So for the next three months, you know, I carried a piece everywhere I went. Really? Um, and uh, I slept with my bedroom door locked and something loaded on the side. Um, and it wasn't nice to have to, it was, yeah, it was pretty stressful. Yeah, of course. You know? But then the next time was... Um, how did that How did that get resolved? Was there a point after that three months you went, you know what, it's been resolved, we shook hands or we stepped away and we both looked each other, we both agreed to step well, away. That and did you of, come back with a bit of egg? No, or were you was, just no, like, no, I'm just happy okay. for it to stop. Yeah. Someone had a word. I was told it was stopped. That was it. I was happy for it to stop. Then I found out at a later date that one of the guys who was sent to my house, I believe, I was told, had um, shot himself playing Russian roulette. <laughs> so it was only one to worry about anyway. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And is that the only time you've been no, shot? Next one, next one was... Um, what year was that first one, roughly? Uh, uh, 1990. 1990, okay. I remember that because they put it in Gangland Britain. 
Did they? Did they? <laughs> yeah, it's in Gang Labour. It's a whole chapter about it. Okay. Um, that sort of got me. That sort of got me on the radar of the police zone. Yeah. Okay. And then after that, they just they just they, they got this bee in their bonnet that I wasn't just a doorman, you know. And then after I met Dave, and a couple of years after that, then I got invited to do the security on the Craze funeral. Yeah. So I visited Reggie. I went in with Dave and visited Reggie about three times in Maidstone. And um, and then uh, me and another uh, one of my doormen who was really crazy about the craze, um, I got him on the job as well. So we went up and we did a we did a shift at the um, was it John English um, yeah. funeral parlour, yeah. and uh, and did the day. And of course, then I was in the newspapers. I was on the front page of all the newspapers. I was on TV, and then the police really sat up and took notice. Yeah. Now then they started. You know, they got their Genesis file, which is a secret file yeah. which no one knows about, and. Um, and it just grew and grew. Um, it's not called Genesis File anymore, yeah. but it's still there. Okay. It's still growing as well. Okay. Yeah, they still keep writing things about me. It's not true. But um, yeah. Um, what was that feeling like, knowing that all of a sudden you're involved in the craze funeral, your reputation's going up and up? Well, it was. It was. But you it? weren't actually involved no. in full-on crime and drugs no. or anything. You no, were, no. But yeah. I met everyone through it. So yeah. I met. I met Freddie Foreman. I met. You know. Um, obviously, I met Frankie Fraser. I met. You know. Everybody that was in that circle. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was, I loved it because it was people I'd read about as a kid. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm like shaking hands with them and having yeah. a cup of tea and a coffee with them. And yeah. it was lovely, but I weren't involved in it. I was yeah. involved only in the security. Yeah. You know, I mean, if someone wanted, you know, if someone wanted looking after, then I was the guy to do it. Yeah. You know, if someone got a, night, a nasty nightclub and they wanted it sorted out, then I'd go and do that. You know, the one I did, um, one I did for Thorley Taverns was up at Sittingbourne, and that was the next one I got shot. At. Where, where's Sittingbourne? Sittingbourne. Uh, it's about, oh, it's sort of like the bottom end of the Midway Towns, mm. but it's it's got. A, what are you talking, Kent here? Yeah, right? yeah, okay. yeah, Kent. Yeah, okay. it's got, a, it's got, it's always had a bit of a nasty reputation. It did back then anyway, very nasty yeah. reputation. And they used to have, when, it, when it, in them days it was called the Kemsley Arms. We used to call it the House on the Hill because it was a housing estate and there was a main road going through it and it was sort of went slightly uphill to this massive pub that held 800 people. So there's this massive pub in the middle of this housing estate, which is a rough estate, but there's only one road in and one road out, right? And, I mean, I'll tell you another story about that in a minute. <laughs> first night I went up there, so the first night I've ever worked there, um, this, this Frank Thorley took it over. We went there and we was about as welcome as a fart in a spacesuit. I mean, yeah. you know, we walked through the door and everyone's like, it, it was like one in Westerns, it all yeah. stopped him. Everyone just stared at us, like, who are they? And I'd, and I'd uh, I used to work with a guy called Derek. I wish we were in Black Derek, because you could in them days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, and, and, and he was a great dormer, but there was hardly any black people up there. Yeah. So he had this really dark black guy with a big white smile. <laughs> and he, I said, just smile, Derek. He's like, right, that's right. But um, the first night we were there, um, there's this group of guys, and they're jumping around. They're obviously on a little bit of gear doing something. And this one guy all of a sudden has gone, bosh, just killed over. So I thought, give him a second to get up. No, he's not getting up. His mate's not you know, moving him. So I went over there and they went, oh, he's all right, he's just drunk, he's just drunk. I said, look, let's just get him up, let's get him outside, yeah. get him some air. So he don't look drunk. And I picked him up and I've got him in my arms. Yeah, so I'm carrying this guy like a baby in my arms, but he's quite heavy. And as I walked out the front doors, he went all limp and pissed down my leg. Uh, he's died. Mm. He's died while I'm carrying him. Oh, God. And so, and I was like, oh, I went, I went, he's, he's brown bread. They went, he's what? I went, he's dead. They went, don't be silly, he's just drunk. Put him on that seat. I said he ain't gonna sit up. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they insisted, so I put him on the seat yeah. just, pff, on the floor. We found anyway, two young guys came out, first aiders, they wouldn't and his mates wouldn't even let him get near him. They was trying to gonna try and resuss him. He was going blue. And uh, ambulance got called, ambulance took twenty five minutes to turn up. He was well gone by the yeah. time the ambulance got there. And then all of a sudden, when he was pronounced dead by the ambulance guy, and now all of a sudden his mates want to blame me because I carried him out. Oh, you threw him out. I didn't throw him out, I carried him out like a baby. Oh, right? So this is the sort of place I had to work in. And that was the first night we worked there. So, uh, and it got worse because we had to clean it up and they didn't really want all the gypsies drinking in there. Um, I actually made some good gypsy friends, by the way. Mm. I'm not totally anti-gypsy. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I had to bar a few people who were just pains in the arses. Mm. Um, and I barred that many. I think that they must have all clubbed in and decided to have me shot. <laughs> so that was the second time. That was the second time. I Where was, on, was that? I was actually on the front door. Uh, it was a lovely summer's night. Um, I was chatting away to, there was a couple of other doormen working, there was about three of us out, I think, on at the time. So I was chatting to one of the other doormen in, in the doorway, and I was very lucky. This motorbike came past the front door, looked at us, and then went round the side to the car park. Didn't think much of it. Anyway, the barmaid's gone, a oh, phone call for you, Marcus. So as I've walked off the front door, what this guy's done, he's, he's got a leather jacket, leather jacket and a helmet. 
he's got a sawn off shotgun and he's he's walked around the wall of the like the, the from the car park he's clung to the wall and he's just spun into the doorway where i'd been standing when he drove past where i was mm. standing and just opened up with both barrels where my where i would have been standing blew a massive hole in the doors um nearly shot some innocent people as well and uh it was only the luck that um i had this phone call i mean otherwise that would have been me i'd been my legs have been wow. gone you know um, but he just done that he, he opened both barrels and he just jumped on his bike and pissed off um, after that, I actually, um, I actually bought a little. I bought a Snub Nose Thirty Eight, which I shouldn't say really. I bought a Snub Nose Thirty Eight, and I used to work. When I used to work there, I used to have that on me. And so, when the gypsies would like one of them, for instance, came to the door one day, and he parked his truck right opposite. And, he's, and I said, "Look, you're barred." He said, "Yeah, see my truck." He said, "He said I've got a shotgun under my front seat." So I pulled my jacket aside and I went, you "See that?" I said, "Now you got to get your truck, haven't you?" Right. <laughs> So, and he was like, "Shit!" You know, and also, all of a sudden, you're dealing with something on their level. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I mean, it's not really the way to go about it, is it? Really, but you know, but it was sort of like fight fire with fire. Yeah. And then when you've already been shot at, and you're having people come into your house to shoot you, and but you're, you, like, you're taking a risk by carrying an illegal weapon or yeah. whatever. But it, one of my friends said, "What was it? Either be uh, judged by six or no, carry, no, judged by twelve or carried by yeah. six. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that was sort of sprung to mind really in them days. I mean. Don't get me wrong. I was not. I was not like it wasn't dirty Harry. I wasn't like yeah. armed every time I walked out the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I went through a stage where I did have a few contracts taken out of me. Um, I did have to buy a proper bulletproof vest, um, and I and I used to like my house. I couldn't just go home and relax. I would have. I had. Um, I cleared all the all the shrubbery from around my house. Had it all block paved. I had these big halogen lights put everywhere. And I used to drive home, and I wouldn't go straight to my house. I would drive past my house. As I went past, I'd push a little button, and all the, these lights would go, poof, yeah. right? Like, like, you know, Blackpool illuminations. Then I'd do a U-turn. If no one was behind me, and no one, I couldn't see anyone around my house, then I'd safe to go home. Wow. Um, I also, at one point, used to have maybe two different cars. So I had, like, my nice car, because everyone kept smashing, trashing my cars at the clubs. It was a bit like Roadhouse. You know where he's got, he buys that old banger, <laughs> yeah, and he goes, yeah, oh, yeah. I'll have that one. Well, I had one of them. So... You know, I had a reasonable reasonable car to go to work in, but a nice car at home. Yeah. And because um, everyone was always keying it up or smashing your windows because mm. they didn't like being thrown out mm. or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Wow. If it, if it where would you, where would you, would you get a buzz of going to work in the evening knowing that you're going to be thinking there was going to be a tear up tonight or knowing the gypsy's going to turn up or knowing that who you threw out last Thursday is going to come back on Saturday because they want a piece? No, I wouldn't say I've got a buzz out of it. Yeah. And, um, and some of them are proper shit myself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, no one's going to enjoy being shot at, right? Yeah. Or even the thought of being shot at. You know, if I could go to work and have a peaceful night, I was happy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If I can go into work, have a really busy night. Yeah. If you if you if you throw a few people out or you stop a few fights, I mean, even now I'm, I'm like on Facebook and all that. Social media is mad. I get people message me now. It's like, oh, you saved me thirty years ago from this. You saved me from okay, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I get loads of people, and I've I've forgotten most of them because yeah. I was doing it every week. Yeah. See, that's the other thing. You when when we go back, we wind the clock right back to where I started. Right. You think about it. Well, most people in a normal in a normal average life, how many times do you have a fight? A proper fight? Couple. In what? Your whole like, life? Yeah, like right. Yeah. Okay. When I was going, when I was working like the Bar Majestic when I first started, yeah. we were having like probably three fights a night. Yeah. Okay. When I started doing six days a week on the doors, yeah. and you imagine that even if you if you're having one fight a week, yeah. right? Then that's fifty fifty two fights a year. Yeah. After ten years, you've had five hundred fights. I've done it for forty years. Yeah. And I was having three fights a night. <laughs> so it's, it's, when I say to people, I say, how many people have you knocked out? I went, I've lost count. Yeah. Thousands. Yeah. Right? How many times have you had a fight? Pff, countless. Yeah. But you do get, you get sort of a bit numb to it. And when you're doing it all the time, you get really good at it. Yeah. I mean, the thing is now, I'm 60 years old, so, and I haven't had a proper tear up in about three or four years now. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing well, mate. <laughs> yeah. so, and I try to avoid them as well, you know, because like, there's always someone bigger, there's always someone tougher. Yeah. yeah? So no, I don't get a, I don't get a kick out of the fights. I, mean, I suppose if when it kicks off and if it all goes well and you end up being you know, coming out of it all right, yeah, yeah you do your adrenaline's yeah. up, you know. Did you did you were you using steroids back in the day? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean that was lots a big, of. Um, yeah, certain. I, I wasn't using massive amounts to start with, but I, I went on to use quite quite yeah probably too much yeah um but you say too much back in late 80s nights no one knew there's no internet to tell you everyone no, was just banging it, was, it in and that's right happened, i mean right? you just got your you, you know, your information like your gear you got from your mate you know yeah, yeah he said take this yeah. <laughs> bob says it's lot really good you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah what does bob know um it was a bit trial and error and you couldn't you know you could, it, there's so much more information nowadays um and there's a lot better stuff out there and so yeah 
it, I mean, I, I wish you know, I wish it was now, you know. Mm. But yeah, but back then everyone was doing a bit of juice, I suppose. But like I said, no one was doing. Well, not not doing. Most people I knew weren't doing massive amounts. But it went along with like when I was a gym owner, you know. Yeah. That was when I owned the gym. That was a good place to recruit doormen yeah. from as well. Yeah, the best place. Yeah, it was great, you know. Yeah. Where was the? How old were you when you at the gym and the doors? Um, I was probably about twenty, like twenty five, twenty five when I opened the gym. Twenty eight when I started the door agency. Yeah. Okay. But um, at yeah. peak, because you're a big man, at peak, I was. how how <laughs> what? Yeah, but you're still a massive man now at sixty, <laughs> and you're great, Nick. I have to say, how big, how, pe how at peak, how big, how heavy were you? Uh, I was about nineteen and a half stone, but in pretty good shape. In amazing shape, and yeah. and ripped with a, yeah. I want to say I was ripped at Not ripped, but you were, you were, I, I yeah. just when I used to compete, I'd go, you know, a couple of stone under that. Yeah. But no, I was in, I was in, I was a good shape. I was massive. I had twenty one and a half in charms in them days. So that were big arms. That's big arms. Yeah. And, and I wasn't, I was never a great bench presser, but I was really strong on deadlifts and pretty good on squats. I mean, basically, you know, if you think about it, we would do, we'd do like standing press with 130 kilos or something, right? Yeah. Which is like heavier than most people. So yeah. when you're throwing people around in a nightclub or you're breaking up a couple of fighters, yeah. it was it was easy. Yeah. You know, you just go, yeah. you know. <laughs> I remember picking people up just by one hand going, Woof, you know, yeah. by the neck. Yeah. You know, I couldn't do it now. I mean, yeah. from shoulder fall off. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. But um, but you built you built up a proper reputation for yourself, yeah. which went national. Wh where was it when you took it even further? Did you go to a hundred men? Did you go to one hundred and fifty men? Did you go to two hundred men? Where what was that we, peak? We went up to about two hundred men. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, about two hundred guys regularly working every weekend, every week. Um, and yeah, it was a it was a you know I'd, what, I'd probably had about three or four area managers in. Um, yeah, it was. It was That's a proper operation. It was a proper operation. Yeah. It was a. It was a. It was a lot to organise. Um, you know. Um, yeah, a lot to run. A lot of pressure, and to try and get it right. You know. Did you feel invincible? Um, I suppose you do up until a certain point. You start. I think I started feeling my age a bit when I started getting on to about fifty. Okay. I, I mean, forties was no problem, but when you you do definitely you definitely are not as sharp or as strong at mm. 50 you're I, mean, I was still pretty good yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> i was yeah. still better than most people were for me <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you know um yeah i think yeah, i think I, I sort of stopped i stopped i really stopped about about a year two years ago and that was uh, i had a shoulder replacement back surgery yeah you know so yeah I, 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 it was time to hang the hang the badge mm. well plus they took my badge off me mm. <laughs> did they what yeah. for yeah. well you got i had an sia license from when they very first gave them out and uh, I lost mine actually um, uh, in the last couple of years. What happened was, I, I had an area manager in Eastbourne running that for me for ten years. Really top guy. And um, What's his name? Uh, uh, Sid, Sid, Alan Sidders, yeah. nice. uh, or Sid we used to call him. Yeah. Great big fella, lovely guy. And he was actually an instructor for the SIA, so he used mm. to teach the courses. So he knows, he knew everything there was to know. Very good guy, uh, worked for me ten years. But anyway, he was going through a bit of a breakup with his missus or whatever. So for some whatever reason, um, he was supposed to recruit the staff, vet the staff and then send all the information to our head office so we could put all them down in the filing cabinet. So we keep a, like a P file on everyone. And um, anyway, a couple of them didn't get, didn't get vetted properly. So what happened was one guy's badge had run out and he told my area manager that he'd renewed it, but my area manager sh it should have actually gone online and checked it. Um, I presume that had been done, so I didn't do it. And uh, anyway, so it all came on top and the SIA rang me up one day and they said, oh, we want to see your records the last six months. We want everybody, we want to know every member of staff, where they've all worked, how much they've earned, where they've worked. I said, look, if you tell me what you're looking for, maybe I can help you. Yeah. Went, no, we can't tell you, we just, we need all this information. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I get a workbook from my accountant. I said, you can have that, yeah. right? It's got everything in it. I'm not hiding anything. I've done nothing wrong. There's my insurances, there's this, there's that. And I didn't know I'd done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they found these two people. One of them had not renewed it, and the other one had actually got the license and he changed the date on it, wow. the expiry date, and he'd falsified it. Somehow, Sid hadn't noticed. So I got nicked because it was my company. Right. Now, that's like, that's like a, if a policeman did something wrong in Bournemouth, right, would they sack the chief of police? No. No. No, no they wouldn't. It's not his fault, is it? Mm. Well, it wasn't really my fault because mm. I had area managers who were supposed to, and I had procedures They're in place. They're protecting it for you. Yeah. I had procedures yeah, yeah, yeah. in place. I had forms that had to be yeah. filled out, stuff that had to be done. And if it was all done, then it couldn't happen. Mm. But it did happen. But it happened on my watch, they said, so they took my license away. So when they take your license away, not only does it mean you can't be a doorman, it means you can't even run a security agency. Oh so God. I couldn't even, not now, I couldn't even run my own security company. 
I couldn't even go and work at McDonald's on the door. Did you know you, I mean? did, could, you, could you take it to court? Could you take it further? You could, you could contest it, but they said, and the worst thing about it is, I can't remember what exactly it's called, but it is actually a criminal conviction. So I spent my life trying to avoid criminal convictions, right? Yeah. And I got one for something that wasn't even really my yeah. fault. Not in my eyes, anyway. At the age of 57? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you had a good run. I had a great run, yeah. <laughs> a great run. Yeah. What was, it? was there any, ever a time when anything come on top? If we, if we put the gun shoot into the side, did it ever come on top? You thought, I'm in proper trouble here. Yeah, I suppose there's been a... Not many, but there was a few times... Um, there was one I can remember, one very early on, when I was working at that Majestic, because that was a rough place. Um, and we had a row there with a the coach party one night, and we you, the one place you don't really want to end up is out in the street, yeah. you know? Um, because you're, uh, yeah. especially when you've got, you're fighting a group. Yeah. Yeah, because they can get, all you, angles. They can get you from all angles. Yeah. And so I thought I was going to be really, I, I, I dropped about three of these guys, um, you know, knocked them out. Mm. And um, anyone come near me, bang, bang. And uh, this one guy, he just kept getting up. Right, and I just thought, fucking, I'll keep eating him. Right, so he's gone down twice, and he's got up a third time. And I thought, so I went to do a roundhouse kick on him, right? Anyway, my trousers were a bit tight, and he caught me foot. So I'm standing there on one leg, right, hopping around in the middle of a big row. And I think, I can't, I can't reach, I can't punch yeah. him. So I thought, well, I can get him with my fingers. So yeah. I've, I've straight finger jabbed him straight in his eyes, and his eyes just popped straight out of his head. So he's, he's literally, his eyes come out of the socket, and he went down that time, he didn't get back up. <laughs> Um, and we carried on fighting. And I think the the only reason we, we, we didn't get like killed was the fact that just after that, I think about five or six of the locals um, just came out and backed okay. us up and then sort of chased them off. Mm. But it was, yeah. I mean, when you're involved in a, a, a scrap like that, it's you're fighting for your life. Yeah. You don't know where it's, where it's going. You don't know where it's going to end. You don't know where it's going to end. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, you're, 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 you're just doing your best, but it's a proper free-for-all, mm. you know. But you, but you, it's amazing what you can get used to, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Because once you've once you've done that a few times, you know, it's. I know. I'm not saying it's not nerve wracking because your adrenaline's definitely up yeah. and you go for it. If you didn't have the adrenaline, you you know you wouldn't win mm. or you wouldn't you wouldn't mm. get through it. But um, and you definitely get better at what you're doing. Now most people, like I said, only have a odd fight in there. They yeah. don't have that many fights. Yeah. So but when you're three, four thousand fights in, yeah, you've got an idea what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> you got to be stupid not to. <laughs> Is there a handful of men on one hand you could name who you'd want on your side? Oh, uh, what doorman I've worked with? You mean just faces doorman you'd want on your side if there was uh, tear up going on? Uh, now or then? <laughs> then, then, then. then. Yeah, and if I, I say if I name them, they might not like it. And if I don't name them, they might not I like, like it. <laughs> um, uh, I can think of a, a face like um, Ian Tucker, for instance. Yeah. He'd be a very good man to have uh, with you, uh, a lot of experience. Um, um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's so there are actually so many. Reel them uh, off, uh, Mickey Fiveholes. They probably get the ump if I say his name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Is that his, uh, Mickey Fiveholes. Mickey Fiveholes, because <laughs> someone shot him five times. <laughs> yeah, while he was asleep, they broke in his house to kill him. And then went, started off at the foot of his bed and went bum, 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 bum. And the gun jammed before they could shoot him in the head. Oh. And he actually woke up. Imagine waking up with five holes in you. And he actually managed to get out of bed and go and phone his own ambulance. He saw the guy running out of the room. Um, and, he, and the reason, he came to work for me in, in Folkestone as a doorman. And he turned up in a red Porsche. And I, well, I thought, he's, he don't need the money. Yeah. He's not he's not for 40 quid a night. Yeah, well, yeah, you know. yeah. But then anyway, I got chatting with him. Yeah, that's, he was just trying to get his confidence back. Okay. But yeah, he used to be in the British judo team. Yeah, he's as tough as old boots. Um, but he wasn't doing the door work because he needed the money. He was doing it just to get his confidence yeah, back confidence after that. And lifestyle. After, yeah, and like, after that sort of thing, you know. Partying. Yeah. Everything that goes with it. Yeah, he's a bit of a nutter. Um, but a nice guy. Any um, others? Yeah, the law. Oh, yeah. yeah. Some I definitely can't mention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got you on the spot now. Um, big Lloyd, like I said. Big Lloyd, bless him. I mean, we're still best mates now. We, we're like a... We like that odd. We like the old um, last of the summer wine when you yeah. see us together. You know what I mean? <laughs> we bicker like a couple. Yeah. But he's a great friend. He's always been there for me, um, and I've always been there for him. So yeah, I, I've worked with him on so many different doors. Um, but he was never really interested in working outside of his own area. Yeah. He used to like working. You know, yeah. a lot of doormen don't like to work outside their own area. Mm. And then there's other people who don't want to work in their hometowns. Yeah. What about you? How did you feel comfortable? Because what's it? Everyone anything. knew you as what. Marcus from Margate. Yeah, the Marcus from Margate bit sort of stuck. Yeah. Um, and uh, the nickname of Big Guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm on my number plate on my car. It yeah, says, I saw that. Yeah, earlier. Big Guy. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I was just, everyone said, okay, Big Guy, Big Guy. Yeah. So it just sort of stuck. Um, but Marcus from Margate, yeah, that, that sort of um, sort of got in there as well. But yeah, um, it's nice being recognised. It's nice. 
I mean, yeah, what I was told years ago, um, was it nice to be important, more important to be nice? Very true. Yeah. Very um, true. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, good saying. But it's, um, I don't know, what, what, sorry, what was the question again? I can't remember. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm enjoying the conversation. I'm just letting it go. Yeah. Just, I think it was the, the ones that, that some, some odd men you would want on your side. If oh, sorry, a yeah, yeah, yeah. On. yeah. Ian Tucker, five yeah, but the thing is, there's so many. I've worked with thousands yeah. of good doormen. Yeah. So there's some really, really top guys. But just um, the ones that springs the mind. Oh, okay, there was a guy, Ken. Um, uh, Ken this was a, quite a good story, right? This guy, when I was trying to expand my business, someone said to me, oh, you need to go to this big club in Maidstone. There's a, the, the doors there, right for the picking. You know, you can, and I don't like poaching doors, by yeah, the way. Yeah. If someone's running a door properly, yeah. right, then I'm not going to go and try and, and try backdoor them, yeah. pardon the pun. Yeah. But I would, if, if, but if that club rings me up and says, look, our door team is shit, can yeah. you come and have a look or sort it yeah. out? Then I will, yeah. because they're, you know, they're the ones paying the money. Yeah. Anyway, so I went up to this club out of curiosity, really, because someone told me about it. So I went up there and I introduced myself, and he's, I'd heard of this guy, he's called uh, Ken Hargreaves. And um, Ken looks like, he's a bit like yourself, he's very smart, he's in good shape, but he's not like overly big, yeah. um, but in good shape, nice, you know, polite looking guy. And I turned up there and he'd, he'd obviously heard of me as well. We, I said hello and I was sitting, we're just exchanging pleasantries and all of a sudden he's gone, oh, I've got to go. So he's got a call on the radio, so he's just run off. I thought, okay, I should run after him, you know, so I went with him. So we've run upstairs into this club and there's a load of gypsies kicking off, right? And uh, anyway, all these doormen have managed to get about half a dozen of them into a fire exit and then shut the door behind us. So we're now locked in the fire exit with all these guys and we've got to go down five flights of stairs to get to the car park. So anyway, all of a sudden, these, these, these gypsies have had a count up. There's five of us, five of them, and they've gone, we're going to go for it. <laughs> so they've just kicked off. And these doormen were amazing. They all just grabbed them and I've never seen it like it. They, they put these proper arm locks on. They've got them all bent over without hitting them. It wasn't a scrap. Yeah. They just controlled it, like restrained them yeah. all. And I was so impressed, right? So I've got, I've got, I've got this one, one geezer's arm up his back. This other fellow I've never met before has got his arm up the other side. And we're walking down the five flights of stairs with him. And this fellow went, who are you? I said, oh, I'm just, I'm Marcus from Marcus. Oh, I've heard of you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> All right. So we're sort of, and these guys, these guys still think that when we get downstairs, we're going to beat him up or something. Yeah. But anyway, we got to the thing. We just opened this door into the car park, just put them all outside, released them all. I went, good night. Nice shut the doors. door. <laughs> that was it. And they were in, uh, they were in the car park on their own, right? And so I thought that was so professional, yeah. right? Who is this guy? Yeah. So anyway, I, I sort of, I've got to know him. I've got to know him a bit more. So I went, I got chatting with Ken. And uh, anyway, at that time, like I said, I'd, I probably had at that time, probably 120 staff, let's yeah. say. But I wanted my staff to be as good as them. Yeah. And I found out that Ken was into martial arts of all different sorts. And he used to actually do all the, on, all, all the um, restraint, control and restraint training. And he used to run all the door courses and stuff. Now, this is be just before the SIA come in. So he worked, he had clubs, he had a big big company himself working through Brighton and all around there. And um, anyway, so I paid him, I paid him regularly to come around and train all my guys to be like his guys. Because mm. I wanted that same professional look, mm. you know, that when something happens, you just poof, you know. Mm. It was it was terrific. The funny thing was, well, not funny, not funny for him. When he, has, he had 14 different licenses. In those days, you had to have a license for each borough. Okay. Each council, like, you know, Bournemouth, yeah, Brighton, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this guy worked in so many different areas. He had 14 licenses, right? He was all over the shop. But when the SIA come in, they refused him. He wasn't allowed to have an SIA license. Why? Because 12 years earlier, he was a getaway driver in an armed robbery. <laughs> And, and, he, and he didn't get and away. And they clobbered him. <laughs> and he didn't get away. So because he had that on his record, the criteria they used for the local licenses, they said, oh, it's 12 years, it's spent. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. But when it came to the SIA, that wasn't spent. Mm. They considered him to be a bad character. Sorry. And, yeah. they, and uh, so, um, yeah, so they wouldn't let him have a license. So it just ruined. He had this massive company and he couldn't run it. You could, know. You, could you get hold of his doors? No, well, what, happened, him? what happened was he had another guy who used to work as his number two who nicked it off him. Right. Um, who, from what I heard anyway. Um, yeah, he's, I think he's still running it. I think what he calls it now. But anyway, he's, he's, he's still running that, that door company. But he actually took one of my doors and he never even went there for two years. No. Never even personally made an appearance. Yeah. Um, they, 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 they got rid of Luminar, got rid of me for one of the contracts. They said they'd... Uh, and, they, and it was all, it's all a bit of a pals thing. So he worked in Brighton. They'd given him one of my Eastbourne contracts and I got a week's notice, no reason, just said, we lost confidence in you. Yeah. And then the next week I went down just to have a look, see who was in there. It was my entire door team. But with, with a new door. With the, with with no, 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 my entire door team. <sighs> but now working for this other company. Did you find out why? Yeah, because he was seeing the, one of the managers 
daughters or something. And he's whacked him so in So he's just got him in a oh, pal's right, okay. bush. How did you, how did you feel? Uh, really pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you deal with it? I uh, didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Honest, governor. <laughs> Honest, governor. Didn't do anything. No. What, was your, what, was your, what was your lifestyle like? Obviously, as we all know, growing up in, in that world, training in the day, work in the night, when you no, finish at two o'clock, what would you do after that around the I clock, was, go partying and stuff? And who yeah. do you, who, what sort of characters were you hanging out oh, with? And crikey. Well, that's the other thing, you see. Like when you, you know, like I said, you, you, you do meet all these characters, obviously, through, through the clubs and through the club scene and the rave scene and everything. You know, so it was in your interest to know who, it's in your interest when you work in an area to know who's the tough guy in that area, yeah. who's the gangster in that area, who's the drug dealer in that area. So if you can get on with them and get a sort of a rapport, mm. so they're not going to be a pain in your mm. ass, you know, that can work. Mm. But the trouble is that, again, see, the police perceive that, or most people perceive it. Like, if, for instance, I'm, if I'm a head doorman, I'm standing at a club door. And there's a guy that's known, he's a, you know, he's a local bad man, and I'm shaking his hand, all of a sudden, I'm a yeah. known associate yeah. of his. Yeah. You know, if I buy him a drink, I'm a known associate. You know, don't get me wrong, it doesn't always work. I mean, it doesn't always work that you can befriend him and it all goes lovely. But it's a lot easier if it does. Yeah. You know, I've had people before, I said, listen, you can't sell your shit in my club, right? Because yeah. I, will, I will have you nicked. Yeah. Or I will this. I didn't like having people nicked, by the way. Yeah. It wasn't really my sort of thing. But you've got good, what I'm hearing and what I'm sensing, you've got good morals on that front. You're running your doors and taking this seriously rather than... Well, this is another reason I, yeah. sort, of, I sort of fell out with the police years ago. We had, I, one of the licensing officers said to me one day, he said, um, right, he said, uh, scenario, he said, uh, you're on the front door, guy comes in, you search him, you find a bit of drugs in his pocket, what do you do? I said, don't let him in. No, wrong answer. He said, you hold him there, you phone us, and we come and arrest him. I said, okay. I said, that's great. You want me to do your job for you, mm. right? I said, but I'm, I'm just here. The reason I'm here is to make sure that all the people coming through that door are set, reasonably sensible. Yeah. They're coming for a good time. Yeah. And they're not going to cause a problem, and yeah. they're safe. Yeah. So to create a safe environment for people to get away from their everyday lives and have mm. a bit of fun, mm. right? So I don't let someone in who I think is going to mess that up. Mm. I said, however... If I, if I, let's say I do do that, let's say I, I say to the guy, right, I'm having you nicked. Mm. So I pull him to one side. First of all, is he going to stand there quietly and wait for me to have him arrested? <laughs> Probably not. Mm. I said, I've got, to, I've got, to, so I've got to restrain him, right? Now, if, if he fights and really fights back, I'm going to have to use more than just restraints. Yeah, yeah. I, you won't let me handcuff him. You yeah. won't let me re, like, contain him like you would. Yeah. So I'm going to have to fight the guy until you get there. And yeah. knowing on your response time, you might turn up 45 minutes yeah. later, yeah. maybe, yeah. right? I'll probably have beaten him up by the time mm. you get there. Mm. And then what's going to happen? Mm. Then you're going to nick me for beating him up. Yeah. So I'm going to lose the license that is my livelihood mm. because I've tried to do what you want. Mm. But if I just don't let him in, there's no problem. Yeah. It's the same as when I used to, uh, I, if, I, if, if I caught someone having a sniff in the toilets, if I caught them, they had to go. Yeah. I didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter if they were a gangster yeah, or not. Yeah. Right? Um, I've kicked some big reputations out before. I just said, look, you're being silly. Fuck off. Yeah. Right? I didn't... Would you say it politely to them? Uh, yeah, yeah. Always would, politely. Yeah, yeah, okay. Always politely. Yeah. I said, listen, like, you got two ways we can go now. I said, like, you know, if you walk out the door, I won't embarrass you. Yeah. Right? You just walk out the door because you decided to leave now. Yeah. Right? And you can come back another week, right, when you've got better manners. Yeah. Right? Or I can drag you screaming and kicking through the club. Yeah. And then everyone's going to know you've been thrown out. Yeah. And I will not let you back in next time. Yeah. So what's your choice going to be? Yeah. You know, <laughs> if you give someone, nine times out of ten, if you give someone an easy option, they'll take it. Yeah. It's the same as if you've got a, let's say you've got a guy and he's round with his missus in the club. Mm. Worst thing to get involved in, like a domestic, mm. right? Because you don't know, well, she might be horrible. Yeah. She might deserve it. But, <laughs> you know, he might. But you've got to try and diffuse it or calm it without taking a side and just try and but give them a way out, mm. you know? Uh, and if you are polite, you've certainly got to be polite. And you've, you've, got, you've got gears in which you go up. You know, you start off on a certain level and you try that. Mm. If that doesn't work, you go up to the next level. Yeah. And it's, it's exactly the same when you're restraining people. You know, mm. it goes up in levels. Mm. You don't just go in at 100% mm. because you hurt someone, mm. you know? Tell me about the Cairns uh, Film Festival. Oh, the Cairns. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah. Oh, God, that was an awful. Yeah, we went, we went down on a... On a like a party bus, really, I suppose you could call it. Who organised it? Uh, I think that was Mr. Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, um, yeah, there was a whole load of us on there, and it was, I'm, I'm sure, the, but there were so many spliffs being smoked on it, I think everyone on the bus was stoned <laughs> by the time we got there, including the driver. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, um, I actually got a lift back with my friend Ian Tucker. 
it took us like 16 hours to drive there or something and he got back in like eight <laughs> he's a he was a getaway driver <laughs> but um he got away <laughs> but um yeah that was quite what were you celebrating out there that was uh the launch of uh, one of dave's films yeah i think it was like hell to hell to pay or, yeah. or hell to make as i called it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think we had. I think there's a load of us had little funny bit parts in that. That was that was quite funny as well. We were, we were one of the filming things we were doing on that one. Uh, we were down in uh, was it Brighton or somewhere around there anyway. One of these like seasidey towns, and we were shooting. We was uh, we were shooting a scene in like a breakers yard, and we all had to bring like we had replica guns. Yeah. You know, they all look real, but they're just firing blanks. Yeah. And we're all running around sort of like playing gangsters in the, in this thing for this film. Anyway, I, I, the girl I was with at the time, it was her, it was her. I think it was, she was so young, about 21st birthday or something. <laughs> so anyway, I, I arranged, I said, to her, I'm going out to the nightclub tonight because it's her birthday and she's been sat all day waiting for us to finish filming. So anyone want to come? So all the cast have gone, yeah, yeah, we'll meet you in the club. So anyway, I managed to talk, I mean, there must have been about 40 of us, but I managed to talk the doorman around and let us all in, right? Because they didn't want to let us in, trust <laughs> me. We didn't look very pretty. <laughs> but I only looked, I, listen, if anyone plays up, I'll sort it out. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. So anyway, um, they, they let us all in. And we all behaved ourselves really well. But where some of us had parked wasn't so good. So one of the one of the guys has parked in, I think, the casino car park, which used clamps. And anyway, this guy's gone out, uh, his name was Big Mark or something. Anyways, he's a great big fella. But he's gone out to get his car and they're putting a clamp on it. So he's, he's like, mate, you can't no don't, you can't clamp that. And the fella went too late doing it. And he, so he went, Take the clamp off. <laughs> Right. So he's pulled, <laughs> he's pulled a replica gun out. And there's no way that he might have deafened the guy, but he's not going to kill him. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he's got to take the clamp off or else. And he goes, oh, shit. <laughs> so he took the clamp off, but he's just given his registration straight to the old bill. Oh. So, of course, they've, they've got his home addresses in London, yeah. but he's down there filming. So they kicked his wife's doors in, first of all. She didn't know what's going on, you know. They're looking for an armed yeah. man. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and then of course she's going, no, he's down in Brighton, he's at such and such a hotel. So they started kicking all the doors <laughs> in the hotel. Yeah, so that was that was quite a funny uh, funny episode to that. Have you ever been banged up? Uh, well, well, arrested and questioned. I've never been in. I've never been sentenced. Never sentenced. I've never ever touch wood yeah. gently. Um, yeah, I'm quite proud of that. Um, I remember sitting in a room in uh, I think around Dave's actually many years ago, and there was a whole room full of like what you class as villains. And I'm sat there, and I suppose I sort of fit in. But anyway, they're all chatting about it for about an hour. They're going on about, oh, I've done a 12, or I've done an 8, I've done a this and that. And they're all like that, you know, I've done, oh, I've done this, I've done that. I'm going, and I'm, so I'm really quiet, because I've got nothing to talk about. Yeah. And this fellow went, how about you, mate? Are we done? He said, I thought I recognise you from Pentonville. I said, no, not me, mate. I said, I, I've been listening to you lot boasting about your fuck-ups for about an hour. <laughs> And it went I'm really like, oh, quiet. It went really quality. quiet. I thought, oh, no. that probably wasn't a good thing. <laughs> and then this big old boy went, yeah, I'll make you right. <laughs> I'll make you right. <laughs> yeah, but it was so. I mean, yeah, at the day, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, the longer your prison sentence, surely that's the worst you've Work, messed of course, up. Yeah, of you course. Know? And that's one of the things I really, I didn't think I'd be good at prison. No. <laughs> I didn't fancy the lifestyle. No. The food wouldn't be too good. No. Training would be all right. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I've been very lucky, I suppose. I mean, that's another thing. I, I got through a stage, I started off with my boxing. And then I went and did a bit of judo. Um, you need you need sort of multiple skills when you're doing that sort of job yeah. properly or professionally on the door. But then I got to a point where as I was getting bigger and stronger and I was still smacking people now and again, I just kept breaking them. Yeah. And I, and it did worry me because, you know, I remember one year I got charged with three GBHs in that one year. And um, two of them were like Section 18s, which is a serious, you know. It's, it's, What's that difference in GBH? What's the difference with Section 18? It's sort of like with intent. Okay. So it's like, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty serious shit. Um, and uh, yeah, they, I mean, at one point they suspended me, me shotgun license, said I was a danger to the public and all sorts. But but I, I was a bit worried because I thought, you know, I, I mean, I, I hit some people and I and I, I've one guy, I fractured his skull in six places. He had to hold his jaw wired together. And I, but he was a prize fighter. Mm. And he told me, he spent half an hour telling me he was going to beat the crap out of me. Mm. So he actually, I believed him. Yeah. So when it actually did kick off with yeah. him, like I said, and I've never started a fight. Yeah. But when it did kick off, I didn't, whereas I normally go bang and leave it, yeah. I went bang, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and I hit him with everything. And yeah it was a mess yeah um and it did it, it still worried me and i thought do you know i thought if i carry on like this i'm definitely going away i'll be i'll, I'll, be, I'll be a manslaughter charge yeah. you know so i actually i had one of my doormen was really good at, at aikido you know stay, same as steven seagal does on, yeah. the, on yeah. tv <laughs> so i started having private lessons and i never took a grading but i did that for about two years so with aikido you learn how to use sort of a grappling wrist locks arm locks okay. and all that um and it's 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 a lot safer 
you know, you're not, you're not hitting people. There's mm. no impact. Mm. You know, so someone grabs you. You can. I, I mean, one of the best things I ever learned was putting a sleeper on someone. A sleeper. Yeah. Go on. So I can, I could put you to sleep if I grabbed you with one hand round your throat. I can block off your blood in yeah. about four seconds. You'll be on the floor unconscious. Yeah. Now you probably might get one or two hits off while I'm doing that. Yeah. You know, but if I go boom, and particularly if there's like a if there's like a wall or something behind you, yeah. And I've got you there where I can put pressure on yeah. you. Um, I mean, a lot of people do the rear naked choke where they put like a choke around someone yeah, and then squeeze yeah, yeah, yeah. them. But I learned to do it with one hand and uh, I was so good at it. So I, I, I no longer had to break someone's head. Yeah. All I had to do was squeeze their neck. Yeah. But you've got to release it. And when you see their eyes roll back yeah. in their head when they yeah. go, you've got to take it off. Otherwise, you can do them some serious brain damage. Yeah. But they just drop on the floor and they wow. just go... Poof. You know, and the first time I saw it done, it was like this guy did it. It's one of my dormant. I went, I went, you got to teach me that. I got to teach me that. I want to know how that's done. And and I just became a master at it. And it was really. Would you rather use that because? Yeah. How tall are you? I, oh, that's another thing. I'm only. Five, I used to be six foot two. Yeah. I'm now five eleven. No, but <laughs> six foot two, nineteen and a half stone. Yeah. You must have had the fear of killing someone with the punches you were letting yep. rip. That's why I never use. I never ever use a knuckle duster. A lot of yeah. doormen, a lot of people out there, a lot of people use knuckle dusters. Everyone you know, should give you knuckle dusters. Yeah. I never. I would never put one on because I knew what damage I was doing with my hands. Yeah. yeah? I mean, the, the, the nearest I got to a knuckle duster was these little babies. Yeah. This little ring that's yeah. got me out of a few few yeah. tight spots. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, it's yeah. I, I was I was dead worried about uh, about going too far mm. it's so easy you know I've seen Dorman like they throw people down the stairs which we did when we were young yeah. we did it you know yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm holding my hands up for that we, we we weren't great Dorman before all the you know after years of experience you get wiser but when you first start doing it you know you think I oh, just throw someone out yeah. but you don't realise you, the the you only got yeah. to fall the wrong way and snap yeah. neck you know yeah. done you know so yeah I mean if I could at the end of the day if I could get someone out peacefully it's the best way if yeah. I could nine times out of ten I wouldn't even have to throw someone out I would actually just walk over to them that's how good it got in the end yeah. my reputation was so good yeah. so I could just look at someone at the other end of the club and go don't you know and they go oh, sorry Mark you know? and honestly it, yeah. was, it was it made my job so easy yeah. right? or I'd walk up to them and go listen you've got to go and they go no but I said no go yeah. and they just walk out because yeah. they didn't want to be thrown out what did you what did you what would you get for a GBH well, for starters, you'd lose your door license. So you would lose your door license. Yeah. What charge would you get? It's a GBH. No, I said, but would you? Would, is that is that what you get? You wouldn't get put away for that. Oh yeah, I mean, you, you so can what, easily, what easily you get? get put away for it. I don't know. It depends what how bad it was. Depends how bad. How, well, it depends on how it all plays out in the court. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is you've got to remember. I mean, I got arrested. Oh, I I don't know. I haven't got the official records, but I know multiple times for GBH, multiple times for ABH, a few affrays, violent public disorders, loads of times I've been in there and I've, you know, I mean, my latest one was only three or four years ago. Um, and it was a guy, I, I, end up, I wasn't even working. I end up, um, a guy actually started a problem in a bar. It was one of the bars we used to put Dorman on a weekend. It was in, on a Wednesday. Down where you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. down near where I am. And um, anyway, I went out to Phil, I went, look, I said, oh, Phil, you've got to go. And, and he, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, you, you make me. I mean, I sort of, as soon as I touched him, he went crazy. So I, I spun him round. You learn a lot of little techniques, and you, like, you can spin someone from their shoulders. So you push one shoulder, pull yeah. the other shoulder. They just end up wrapped up in a neck lock, right? Yeah. So I've got him in this side, and I've put him in a full Nelson. So I've locked him right up. He can't do much to me. I'm dragging him out. He's got a bunch of mates with him, and I'm on my own. But uh, I know where all the cameras are as well, so I'm, 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 I'm very mindful of what I'm doing. I've got him outside. He's still struggling. He actually tore my elbow. He's struggling mm -hmm. that hard. And I said, listen, mate, if you just stop struggling, I'll let you go. He said, let me go and I'll stab you. Mm. Now, I don't know if he's got a knife on yeah. him or if he's going to stab me, but I'm not going to go, oh, OK, then. Yeah. Right? And would a policeman do that? No, they wouldn't. No. If you said you're going to stab him, they'd gash you, cost yeah. you and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I thought, right, right OK, you want to stab me, OK. So I lifted him off the ground. I swung him like that and I smashed him on the floor really hard. Mm. And as his lead popped up, I, I pinged him mm. once and knocked him out. And uh, anyway, I went back in and his face were at the bar and I went, right, who's next? <laughs> And they all went, oh, talk shit themselves. <laughs> so they've all left, right? But when they saw their friend outside laying on the floor, and they've all got a little bit upset, and then he's got up and he's phoned the police. Right. So I, I, I literally I just got home, I, and I, my, my wife tried to get involved. I was with my wife, and she tried to get involved in, in the middle of it. And so I'd had a row with her. I said, Look, don't, you know, whenever that sign kicks off, you've got to just get out of the yeah. way because you could actually get me hurt by yeah. being in the way. Yeah. So anyway, while I'm arguing with her, so I've gone home, we've gone to bed. And then next thing you know, I've got the blue lights outside my house and the police cars turned up and, and then another police car turned up and they're all banging on the door mm. and they're nearly kicking the door in. 
And I thought, oh, shit. So I went down there and, and I've opened the door. They all jumped back and they got the gas and they're like, oh, are they? Yeah, I went, I went really? Really? Yeah, all this for yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They went, yeah, I said, uh, you've got to come with us. We've got a warrant for your arrest. I was like, I said, look, I said, I really don't want to go anywhere. I said, I'm in bed. Yeah. And I said, you could be tampering with witnesses. I said, there's no witnesses in my room. <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, I smacked a fellow. I said, oh, he said, oh, you're not denying it. I said, no. I said, listen, I'll come down and make a full statement tomorrow. I said, but that's tomorrow. I said, how about I just shut this door? He said, shut the door, we'll kick it in. Oh, okay. I said, all right, I'll come with you. Not wearing any handcuffs, all right? I said, otherwise, I'm not going to go peacefully. Yeah. So they went, okay. So I got in the car and they drove me to the police station. And uh, and my wife was in tears. She did because where she comes from in Thailand, you know, if the police take you away, it's not a good yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, you might yeah, not be yeah. seen again. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, okay, anyway, so I got to the police station, and uh, at that time I was waiting for it. I was waiting for an operation on my nose. I couldn't hardly breathe, and I had this. I left this spray at home, which I needed for my nose. So I said to him, "Look, could you please do me a favour? Can you go back to my house and get me nasal spray?" I said, "I'm, I'm having a real struggle to breathe." Yeah, okay, so I sent someone back. I said, "I oh, will get me wallet." I said, "Because I'm going to need a taxi when you finally let me out of here tomorrow." So anyway. They come back and this, uh, this this woman come in. She said, um, uh, "She said I'm your first aider for the night." She says, "And uh, just to let you know, we've got your we've got your spray and we've got your wallet for you." I said, "Okay." I said, "Can I have the spray?" She went, "No." I said, "Well, you just gone and got it for me. Why can't I have it?" She said, "We don't know what's in it." I said, "Well, read the label." <laughs> she said, "It could be drugs in it." I said, "I'd send the police back to my house to get drugs." I said, "Have you noticed any music or flashing lights in here?" <laughs> I said, "It's not like I can rave on." I said, I, I, "All I want to do is go. I don't want to be able to breathe." Yeah. I said, look, just let me have a squirt of it. You know, I said, you can have some if you want. Yeah. You know, and she wouldn't let me have it. She said, anything else wrong with you? I said, actually, I said, I think there might be. I said, as you can see, I said, big old chap. I said, oh, I take steroids. I think I've, I said, I've got, I think I might have a DVT in my right leg where I've done an injection. She went, mm. she went, I said, well, you can't leave me in here. I said, I could die. <laughs> so anyway, so she went, okay. So she got two of the police that have arrested me have now got to take me up the hospital. Yeah. So they took me up the hospital. And I got a private room with a bed, right? And they got a plastic chair. And so I, I, we sat there and they started doing blood tests and things on me, right? So anyway, I kept these two awake. They were trying to fall asleep. They're like, they're, they've always been on night shift. I just kept telling them loads of boring stories from the past and everything. And uh, anyway, finally the doctors come in at about five in the morning after all the blood tests had come back. He went, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you, Mr. Everett. I said, no, I didn't think there was. I said, but I just wanted to piss them two off. I said, because they stopped me from sleeping in my bed. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Quality. Yeah. Anyway, so I went to court. Yeah. Anyway, I went to, back to the back to the police station. Got charged with ABH. The guy that I had the problem with had been arrested twenty four times that year. Right. Okay. I hadn't been arrested for twenty four years. Yeah. All right. So it went to court, and by the time it went to court, he realised who I was, and all the statements were withdrawn. So when I went into the court, and the judge said, "How did you plead?" I went, "Well, not guilty." Yeah. So he went. He went to the prosecutor. He said, um, "What evidence do we have?" She said, "Well, we did have we did have um, three witness statements, and the and the uh, the person." She said, "What do you mean you did have?" She said, "Well, they've all withdrawn them." <laughs> he said, "Well, you don't really have anything, then, do you?" <laughs> he said, uh, "Would you be prepared to be bound over for a year?" Yeah. I said, "I said thank you very much, Your Honour." <laughs> so, posh, that was it. So I got Holy bound sorry. over to keep the peace for a year. But you know what? They still wouldn't let me have my door license back for uh, four months, right. and they wouldn't let me have my shotgun license back for a year and a half. And why uh, did they take your shotgun license because away? Because they said I was, even though I hadn't been. I'd only been accused of an ABH, yeah. not found guilty, but they they took my door license away and my shotgun license one week before the court case, yeah. and said I was a danger to the public. Right. So I mean, which is mad, mm. really. I'm not a danger to the public. Um, I'm really not. I'm actually yeah. a nice guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But that's been your world. It's mad to think you've had a world of forty odd years on the doors. Yeah, yeah. All those. I mean, you think of all the thousands of yeah. fights. Yeah. The thousands of ejections, you know. The, I mean, there's some real nasty ones as well. You know, I said some real big bad ones. Um, big bad. Well, big big bad fights. You know. Yeah. I mean, you know. Um, like I say, Is there one that springs to mind? Mm, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> there are so many. <laughs> I said the one only one with the, the eye one stuck in my head yeah. a little bit. Um, Do you know you said you had two hundred doormen? Yeah. Were you would have? Were you? Do you reckon you would have had the biggest? firm in the uk at the time uh no 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 definitely not i think um oh what was it uh just trying to think of the name of it now i mean i mean there were some other big companies but they also had lots of their numbers were made up uh where they had lots of stewards as well right okay. you, know, you got like show sick yeah, and okay, people yeah, like that yeah, yeah, yeah. um but no there were some other door companies that had like sort of five six hundred maybe a thousand really? door staff yeah 
some of the really big ones. And a lot of the big companies have gone around buying up small ones. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I mean, you know, that's I mean, that's I got offered I got offered very good money for my company at one point, but I didn't want it to go that way and just get dissolved yeah. into something else. It's it's actually it's still Mark One Security is still going now. Um, it's doing pretty well, and it's being run by a guy called Gareth Brett, who mm. I've known since he was, you know, I've known him for thirty years. Yeah, good guy, and uh, he runs that now. And it, I hope he makes a good living out of it because mm. for me, it's nice to see that that name is still there. Yeah. yeah, Mark One. Yeah, yeah, Fair Mark play. One Security. Do you remember any of the clubs you used to go raving at? Ministry, Gas Club, did you do any of them? Yeah, Ministry, ministry and Gas were two favourites. Yeah. Uh, we did do lots of things. We did the boat parties and all sorts. Boat, but, yeah. but the regular ones was, well, the Ministry was the regular one because, well, one, because we could get in through the back door easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or the front door, <laughs> just depending who was around. Um, but yeah, it was, I, and I used to love the Gas Club on a Sunday night yeah. because that was, like, that was like testosterone heaven. On a Sunday night, most of the doormen who'd been working over the weekends would go there yeah. and they would party till like six o'clock Monday morning. Morning, yeah. which was yeah probably not you know, great for your health but it was fun uh yeah and it was, it was, it was, it was I, I think at one point i knew just about all the main guys around the west end because yeah. and i was welcomed everywhere yeah. i mean, always because i was always very, very respectful i was always well behaved yeah. you know um yeah and it was it's nice to be nice to be nice yeah nice absolutely. to be liked nice to be liked and nice to be nice yeah. what's your world like today marcus Today, sixty years old. Oh, yeah, sixty it's, years young. It's hard coming to terms with it. Do you know what? Yeah. It's like because it became such a big part of my identity. You know, growing up, growing up all those years, and like you know, and and, and being known as big guy and and uh, you know, Mark from Margate and all that. It's lovely, and it's lovely to have that recognition. And, I've, and, I've, and I get I get people now they wave to me to stop me in the street and hello, and I, and half of them I don't know, yeah. but I'm never rude. Yeah. I'm always polite, and I think it's it's very flattering that people know you and, and re respect you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been really weird. I haven't. I, it's been hard uh, stepping away from the doors, and just sort of being trying to be a normal guy, really. You know, and it's the same as like I, the thing I started out in Thailand. I mean. I um I've sold off all those houses now. I've just got one big house out there now, which I'm trying to sell at the moment. But um yeah, I, I so I'm, I'm having to adjust to a whole different life, you know, um, physically, mentally. You know, I, I still want to stay in shape. I'm still me, but I, you you know you just can't you just can't carry on. Yeah. So I now do. I've now got hobbies like archery. <laughs> you know. I do archery and I do qigong. <laughs> What's qigong? <laughs> Qigong's a bit like tai chi. Okay. So it's a bit like yeah, my wife takes the piss out of me. Yeah. Um, but it's so your life, your life over the last two three years has properly calmed down. It sounds. Yeah. If you had your yeah. last tear up three years ago, yeah, it's calmed down. You spend a lot of time in Thailand. Yeah. Back and forward. Yeah, back and forwards. I mean, my my plan at the moment is because now I don't have the I don't have the income that I used to have. But yeah. luckily, I wasn't stupid, and I did invest a lot of money into properties out there. I've sold those properties, and then I've invested the money back here. Brilliant. So I've now got a few properties around me. So I've got an income without going to work, and I, yeah. I've got enough to get by on over here. Mm. But it's not enough to really support my my lifestyle that I had over there as yeah. well. So yeah. so I need to sell the last house I've got out there. But my plan is to, because my wife's Thai anyway, and because I also, I run a, I've been running a charity called Big Guy Charity um, out in Thailand for the last 20 years. Um, if you look it up on Facebook, you can like us. Yeah. We do just, we just raise money and we don't do anything but good stuff. Yeah, yeah so I go in, uh, this, this time we've just took out 500 orphans right for a day out to the beach paid for their their drinks their ice cream their food yeah. you know it's amazing to do it and, and 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 it's just it's just you can't really explain the feeling of giving back it, it gives yeah. you yeah, yeah and and when i go back in the winter this year i'm planning on going to chiang mai and chiang rai where i've helped out some really really remote schools up in the mountains where the elephants are on it chiang mai yeah, chiang rai, yeah. yeah well they're all over thailand anyway yeah, all thailand, yeah. <laughs> and the opium but <laughs> i haven't found that yet <laughs> uh, but but the, yeah i like, you know putting a like putting a school together where you know children are going to be taught for the next 20 yeah. 30 years yeah. it's pretty cool stuff mm. you know but but a lot of people just don't realize that side of my life that was always that was like my hobby mm. but now that hobby can become a bit more of a passion for me yeah so i haven't got i don't have a i don't have a, you know any work as such in the day so i i get up and, and just do my fitness stuff and yeah. go to the gym and try and be as healthy as possible uh, and i plan on living my summers in england and my winters in thailand mm. Cause I hate the winters here. Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> it's horrible. horrible. If you noticed any side effects of X amount of decades taking steroids as you're at the age you're at now? Yeah, I mean, I've yeah, I've suffered. I don't know whether it's the steroids or not, but yeah, I've got um, I got diagnosed in 2016 with uh, two partially blocked arteries in my heart. Whether that was steroids or not, I don't know. But whenever you take steroids, everyone always blames it. You know, yeah. if you was a smoker, they'd blame smoking. Yeah. Um, but but I've my spine. Uh, I've lost nearly three inches in height 
which is quite dramatic. I thought you were taking the piss earlier. No, no, six foot two, no, five seriously. Foot um, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's why that big Lloyd always takes the piss out of me because he's still six foot four. four. He goes, you're so short. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, um, yeah, you, you know, it, so my spine has crumbled and when it was sort of crumbling down, it squashed the nerves. I mean, I, I went through a stage the other year where I couldn't hardly walk for two months and I and I, the NHS was going to take two years to get me to an operation. So I paid ten thousand pound had private surgery on my on my spine. I had um, L one to L five operated on, and um, and although it's a successful operation, I think the surgeon done an amazing job. Um, but I have been left with like I've been left with like nerve damage in my okay. legs, and yeah, I just don't feel great. Yeah, you know. Um, so yeah, it's I, I don't know. So, I, so now it's like I just try and be as yeah as try and fit and healthy yeah. and. Because it's not a case of getting more years; it's or putting uh, sorry, more years on your life. It's getting more life in your years. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know. What's it like when you tell people your age? You're sixty. Um, most people think I'm fifty. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you look bloody good for sixty. Yeah, I do dye my yeah. beard though. Yeah. <laughs> And shiny head. Oh, well, the, the shiny head's not really an option. It's either shiny or I've got, otherwise I've got like this Coco the Clown thing going on because it will just grow around the sides, you know. But yeah, bald's all right, you know. It's, 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 it's easy. Everyone, everyone, kind of my friends have went, why don't you go and get hair transplants? Yeah, you know, yeah. well, because it will still be grey. It'll still be grey. <laughs> have you got any last words to say, anyone, um, over your 40, 45 years working on the doors? Oh, last words. Uh, I don't know, really. I think... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Um, I think a lot of people over the years didn't really know me well enough. I think a lot of them misjudged me. Um, but I think anyone that really got to know me knew that I was just basically a pretty good guy, never caused any trouble, stopped a lot of trouble, yeah. and was always out there trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And I really was. Um, and that sounds probably a bit cliche, but yeah, I was, like I said, you know, if I could go to work, if I could go to work in the old days and have a good, I mean, I used to love the rave days, right? Because yeah, they, were, they were so trouble free anyway. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's another. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry yeah, have we got any more time? No, mate. This is right. good. I mean, look. I mean, I remember one time the manager called me in, and there's a guy. He's got his shoe off, and he's sat on the floor, and he's looking at his shoe like this, and he's going, "Wow!" <laughs> right. He's, he's, it turns out he was on acid. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But this shoe would like, and I went, and then they go, "Throw him out! Throw him out!" You know, he's an idiot. I went. I said, "Come on, mate." I said, "Why don't we take the shoe out to the reception, and we can see it better?" <laughs> <laughs> you know. So he's followed me out to the reception with the shoe. You know, and like, listen, if I could talk that guy out. You know, another doorman who's less experienced might grab him, yeah. drag him out. Throw his shoe out. You know, out. then he'll yeah, end up yeah. wrestling. Then he might fight back. Then he'll end up getting a clump. You know, yeah. all I did was to take him and his shoe outside. We had both had a chat about it and he went home. Yeah. You know, um, so I remember doing a rave once. We did a, we got the, I got the contract for a weekender. And it was, it was, a, um, it was, a, what was it? it's like a holiday park near Dimchurch. Okay. Um, like Pontins or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So this, you know, this holiday park, it was a whole weekend. Starts on a Friday, ends on a Sunday. Uh, or Monday, I can't remember. Anyway, it's a long weekend, and I needed 25 doormen to do it, which is a lot. Bearing in mind, I've already got everyone working Work at weekends. On the doors, yeah. So I and, and I wanted a really good team, so I had to nick I had mm. to nick people. But I I handpicked these guys because I wanted it to be I wanted it to be the right team. Mm. So I ran it myself. I also put some very very good guys, but virtually everyone I put in there liked raves. Mm. Right, because I didn't want I didn't want a jobs worth going in there going I'm going to find some drugs in here because yeah. he would have yeah, done yeah, it. Yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. right, you spend all night just throwing people yeah. out. Plus, you can't throw them out because they booked a chalet, so basically oh, you're stuck with them, right? Yeah. So they book in, they pay a lot of money for these yeah. tickets. It's got like it's got like two or three rooms going. Yeah. You had I think you had two different rooms plus a VIP, and and so I was given I was trusted enough to uh, these like gold wristbands I could give out to VIPs. Mm. So that's another thing. So when you've got the naughty boys turn up who are a bit special. Have a gold yeah. one. Behave yourself. Yeah. You're in the VIP, yeah. right? You could keep the order a little bit easier, but yeah. So we had to literally we were working practically twenty hours a day because it's it, it was like you, you didn't hardly get any sleep over the whole weekend. Mm. But it was mental, and the and and I remember the review after the first one. Everyone said how amazing the doormen were because we were so we had so much empathy for mm. the people raving you know if you saw someone on the floor who'd basically overdone it mm. you know you think right okay get him out get him to the first aider yeah. get him some water yeah. make sure he's not dehydrated because you, you didn't much want to go you didn't just kick people out yeah. and like I said they're staying all, they're staying in a chalet so you try and make sure they had someone with them you know mm. the last thing you want is someone going back to the chalet and they die of an overdose mm. or something mm. you know 
Um, and like I said, you could also, but when you had real nuisances, it was really hard to like, you had to sort of like banish them for a few hours or something. So you come back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Come back tomorrow when you calm down. Yeah. You know, or I won't let you in. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, but you had to run it, but it was amazing. It was, uh, yeah. What was it like for you? Do you remember the time you first took your first pill? And what was it like for you and all your mates were all big lumps when you know everyone was pilled up? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> there were some times when, yeah, I mean, I mean, let's face it, I, mean, I can talk about it now. Um, but yeah, I used to love, I used to, I mean, I first found out about, you know, parties and raves and the music. I remember watching um, Carlton Leach talking about yeah. it and it's very much along the lines of that, you yeah. know. I mean, bearing in mind, remember me and Carlton did meet him one of these parties, you know, yeah. and we just chatted all night. <laughs> Don't think we did any partying or dancing or anything. We just talked, talked, talked. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, you made a lot of good friends. It was a, it was wicked. But yeah, the first time was like blew your mind. Yeah. It really did. It just opened up this whoa, you know. Yeah. And no wonder all them little skinny people are drinking water. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I think they're all totally mad yeah. before that. Yeah. You know. But isn't it funny how, how it, the whole vibe changed? It was just... Where what? everyone would go out, come, finish the footy, come back in a club, drink 10 bottles of Bud, have a, bottle, have a tear up, did it? And all of a sudden, overnight, it oh, turned into peace it, and love. It and, was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, do you know what? If they could have just legalised yeah. it... Yeah. Do you imagine, if the they could have legalised that, instead of, like, alcohol... Yeah. I mean, let's face it, alcohol's a drug, smoking's a drug, yeah. everything's a drug, you know. But if they could have legalised ecstasy, I mean, what a good antidepressant that was. Yeah. Everyone was so yeah. happy. You bump into someone and they'd say sorry. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> amazing. But it was, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, you could have thousands of people up all night and not have a fight. Yeah. You know? I mean, that was something they should have really looked into. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but I mean, instead, I mean, now you've got the, I mean, we've got, I mean, just recently, we've had five stabbings in two weeks on Ramsgate Seafront. You know, um, and uh, everyone's coked up. Everyone's got an attitude. Everyone's Everyone, egg. Yeah, yeah, and they're all like, you know who I am. You're nobody. You're an yeah, idiot. Yeah. You know, but they, they're trying to make this reputation for themselves. And unfortunately, people get injured and people get hurt, you yeah. know. And, and normally it's some poor innocent because they don't, these people are bullies and they pick on a soft target. Yeah. I, I've got, I've actually got on my phone a, a recording which was taken off of one of the cameras outside a bar. There was a, there was two girls and a little gay guy. Yeah. I mean, he was like, you know, he was like eight stone ringing wet. He was no threat to anyone. Mm. They've had a good night. These little three, they're trying to get back to their car and a group of local like hoodies decide to like, just bully them. Mm. So they they got around them. They really want to get the dig the gay guy out because he's gay, and and the girls are trying to stop it. But anyway, in the end, they finally they batter him, and they and they, they don't just knock him down or knock him out. They then take turns at stamping on his head. The one of the girls actually tries to intervene, very brave of her, and uh, she gets knocked out. And then they, they then this guy takes his belt off no. and he beats him with a belt no. buckle and he fractures her eye socket, nearly takes her eye out. Um, and it, the, the weird thing was that just along the road in one of the little bars there was some of my old doorman working mm. and they, they, although they finished work they were just clearing up they heard a, they heard the thing outside in the street so there was no police around by the way as usual so they've actually come out to see what's going on and they see all this going on so they've they've managed to sort of like verbally move them away but then these guys have pulled knives out mm. and want to have a row with the doorman but anyway they managed to get the two girls up and the little guy and they got them in a car and they managed to get them off you know so they, they, they got them away from there but these these idiots went after them then in their car, and then they caught up with them. This was in Ramsgate it happened. They caught up with him in Margate, which is a couple of miles away, dragged them all out of the car and gave him another good idea. Right now, when she went to the police station, she was told um, that it wasn't. It, she, you know, she, oh, are you sure? Are you sure you want to press charges because yeah. these are really nasty people, mm. you know, and it will cause problems mm. for you. And anyway, they basically talked her out of it. Yeah. Then I saw the CCTV footage, and I actually I don't normally you know run to the police, but I I thought these these guys need yeah. to be sorted out, and I knew I knew two or three of them, so I did what I could do, which was I barred them from all those bars along the seafront, yeah. all the ones I knew I could have barred them. You're not coming in because if that's what you're doing, mm. we don't want you in. Mm. I then took this, I burnt a copy off and took this to the police, and I said, look, you need to look at this. You know, I said, look, I've got these three of the names. I don't know who the others are. Anyway. Well, a week later, I rang him up. She's like, have you, have you got any of them yet? Have you nicked any of them? No. Mm. It's not in the public interest. Mm. It's not in the public interest. Mm. It'd be in the public interest if that was my doorman yeah. doing that, yeah. right? But these guys, even to this day, no one has ever been arrested for it. In the end, right, one of the guys kept denying it was him. He kept saying to me, hey, it weren't me. He said, you keep bad mouthing me. You barred me, blah, blah, blah. He said, it's not me. It's not me. I said, I'll tell you what. Come to my office on Monday morning. I said, I've got it on, I've got it yeah. on my computer. I said, let's watch it together and we'll see if it's you or not. Yeah. 
right? He never turned up. Yeah. And I said to him, if you don't turn up on Monday morning, I'm going to stick it because I'm so fed up with the police. I said, I will stick that on social media so everyone knows what a coward you are because yeah. he was stamping on the girl's head. And I put it out there and, yeah, it's, I think it's tainted his reputation yeah, quite badly. But no one was ever arrested about it. No mm. one was ever questioned about it. No one was ever arrested. And yet there was the evidence yeah. clearly for it. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah, and, and like it got say, like though, it got thirty odd thousand views. Yeah, isn't it mad though? If it's the doormen, they'd have been all over you. Yeah, oh, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is you know, this is the other thing when you like, when you work on the doors. Like, I remember one day we got we used to do all the bars on Ramsgate Seafront. So there's about there's about nine bars, it was like stripper bars, and there was a guy in one bar was being chased by a doorman along that seafront, and the doorman's like dived on him, like rugby tackled mm. him, and smashed him to the floor quite hard. And these people saw it and they were like, ah, oh, you bastard, get off of him, you know, da da da. Right, and they started having a go at the doorman, started attacking the doorman. When they finally found out, why was he being chased? Mm. He just put a glass in a girl's face. Oh, he just just smashed glass into a young girl's face, then bottled another doorman on the way out the door. That's why we was chasing oh, him, mate. right? You know, so sometimes when you see the end result, yeah. you've got to try and actually ask yourself, well, okay, what why? is it, what was what? it, yeah, what was yeah. it start over? Yeah. I mean, when you, t you talk about, if you talk about like bad injuries, I think one of the worst injuries I've ever seen in a nightclub was a young girl. She had her face razored open by a guy who didn't want to queue up for his coat. He, uh, he pushed in a queue, uh, about 50 people queuing up. He's just pushed to the front. And this girl went, excuse me, what are you doing? Mm. And he just turned around without a word and just went, oh, mate. right? And her cheek, I'm not kidding you, was you could see her cheekbone oh. for it. And they, I didn't used to do, I never used to do the first aid normally, but the first aider was throwing up when he saw it. Yeah. So I had to go in and hold her face together while we got the ambulance in. And I had to kneel in front of this girl. I put like a towel on her face. And, I, and at first I thought a piece of her face was missing mm. because it was that far yeah, apart. Yeah. It looked like a big piece was out of it. But when you actually picked her cheek up, yeah. it actually joined. And, uh, and the weird thing was, I can't remember her name, but I actually, I, 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 I talked to her for about, 25 minutes while they were waiting for the ambulance and I just kept her calm and I talked to her about her children and who she was out mm. with and I just I just kept Get firing mind off it. just kept firing yeah. questions out I had to stop her thinking could, oh, what's my face what's yeah. my face like anyway and, and do you know what the really weird thing was it's quite quite gratifying I, I bumped into her I saw this girl and this this because this happened like over 20 years ago mm. and I was, I was in working recently in a bar a few years ago in a bar in Ramsgate I saw this girl come out she had this really deep scar here I went excuse me I hope you don't mind me asking I went but how'd you get that and she went, oh, I was her one day, just like that. I said, oh, I said, oh, I was a guy having your face together. Oh, and she was like, give me a big oh, hug. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she said, oh, she said, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Marcus, uh, this has been an eventful, eventful podcast episode. Yeah. You've certainly lived an eventful life. Yeah. For, we've only scratched the surface. We've only scratched the surface. <laughs> and you know what? I would love to come and do a part two because I, I know there's loads more stories. Oh, there's loads. <laughs> loads more stories. But I really appreciate you coming down. I really That's appreciate your honesty. That's been a pleasure. Yeah. yeah, it's been nice to get some of it off my chest. Actually, like some of yeah. it, I don't know. Yeah, it's nice. It's been yeah. really good. Well, people always leave and go, "God, that was cathartic. I enjoyed that." You know, once you because you get it off your chest, don't you? It's kind of yeah. like a, a nice, yeah, no. yeah. No, it's good. And there's loads more where that comes. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> You're an absolute star, Marcus. Nice one. I really appreciate the effort. My pleasure. Good man. Good Thank man. You.